been in integrated operations for the past about 30 minutes. We will have some commentators from their mission control join us just here shortly. We're about nine minutes out from that AI burn or that approach initiation burn. Hello, and thanks for tuning in to the NASA SpaceX Crew-4 mission, a long-duration rotational mission to the International Space Station. I'm Kate Tice, Quality Systems Engineering Manager here at SpaceX, and I'm joined by NASA's Dan Hewitt. Now, we're just a few hours away from the final approach and docking of Dragon to the International Space Station. The crew is awake and ready to monitor the final steps, so let's re recap the mission thus far. Yeah, launch day preparations started early for the crew members on their launch day. About four hours prior to the launch, they completed their final medical checks and then joined the SpaceX team to get into their spacesuits. And then after suit up in the NASA operations and checkout building, they walked out, waved final farewells to their family and friends outside and then got on to their next destination, the launch pad. It was about a 20 minute ride out to pad 39A where Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon were waiting for them. Just two and a half hours before launch, they ingressed, they got inside the Dragon spacecraft, walked through the, after walking through the crew access arm, got a last look out of the windows at the Florida Space Coast, uh, and then got into the white room and into the vehicle. And then about 40 minutes prior to the launch, crew access arm retracted, T minus 35, the launch escape system was armed, and that got the Crew Dragon ready to escape if necessary. And then we got on to the propellant loading. And so we were able to get all the propellants onto the vehicle. Uh, that started with about 35 minutes to go. So we got all of the fuel, the oxidizer on both the first and the second stage of Falcon 9. And then just five minutes before launch, we went into terminal count with all the onboard computers taking control of the vehicle. And then, of course, the moment we were all waiting for at 3.52 a.m. Eastern, 12.52 a.m. Pacific, the nine Merlin M1D engines ignited and Falcon 9 lifted off from Space Launch Complex 39A, marking the fourth time humans rode Dragon into orbit. With Falcon 9 first stage at full power, our crew began their journey to the International Space Station. In fact, on the screen you see right now, that's a live view of Dragon on their way to the station. Uh, now, just after the T plus nine minute mark, the first stage landed on the autonomous spaceport drone ship. Freedom on Dragon to Ground. Dragon SpaceX, Dragon to Ground, ready to copy. Yeah, we just wanted to give you guys a heads up that uh, during the PAO event, uh, the light on the front of the... Uh, and so we weren't sure if it was still transmitting or not, but it uh, sounds like you were still getting it from, uh, from your end. Uh, but we wanted to let you know that that light did extinguish. Okay, copy all. Your voice call dropped out. I want to clarify that the light on the floater cam dropped out during the media event. Yeah, that's a good read back. About halfway through the event, we noticed the light was not illuminated, but I think you guys were uh, still receiving video. That's a good intuition. We had video the whole time and uh, expected the light to go out. Uh, not necessarily at that time, but uh, expected it to go out, so all good. Okay, sounds good. Just want to make sure you're aware. Thanks. All right, so some back and forth there uh, with SpaceX Core or Crew Operations and Resources Lead, Jake Vendel, 
uh, smooth, velvety voice with Jake, uh, really <laughs> just uh, communicating back and forth with the crew, the crew just letting us know on the ground um, the the light dropped out from the camera that they were using, uh, but all good. Um, so back to the quick recap we were doing uh, just after the drone ship landed on uh, our, our, excuse me, just after our first stage booster landed on our drone ship, which was stationed out in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, we had spacecraft, se spacecraft separation where we saw Dragon finally flying free. Uh, now, our initial orbit after Dragon separated from Falcon 9 was 210 kilometers by 190 kilometers. Now, for those that might not be familiar, those values represent the orbit apogee, or the highest point over Earth, and the perigee, or the lowest point over Earth. Uh, basically, meaning that uh, the orbit is not a perfect uh, not, is not a perfect circle, and rather more of an ellipse. And over the last several hours, Dragon's been gradually raising that orbit. Uh, just 50 minutes after liftoff, we executed the phase burn at about 1.41 a.m. Pacific time, 8.41 GMT. Uh, that was the first of the five major burns required to raise Dragon's orbit and position it for that final approach to the International Space Station, which we're coming up on very soon. Uh, and it's used the Draco thrusters on the vehicles several times over the last several hours uh, as it continues to chase station down. And just a few hours ago, the boost burn took place at 10.34 a.m. or 5.34 p.m. GMT. Uh, the boost burn put our crew in an orbit where Dragon's apogee, or that highest point that I mentioned, uh, will be 10 kilometers lower than the station. After that, we executed the close co-elliptic burn at 11.19 a.m. Pacific. The close burn placed Dragon on an orbit roughly co-elliptic with the space station, meaning it was maintaining an orbit roughly 10 kilometers lower than the station the entire way around Earth. That's in contrast to only being 10 kilometers lower than the station during Dragon's apogee, or the highest point in its orbit, orbit uh, which is achieved by the boost burn. And then after that, we kicked off the transfer burn that took place at about 12.07 p.m. Pacific, 19.07 GMT. Uh, and that was the fourth major maneuver. It's the transfer burn. That's where we're raising Dragon's apogee, or again, the highest point of its orbit, to just two and a half kilometers lower in the station. And then we rounded everything out with that final co-elliptic burn at about 12.53 p.m. Pacific, 19.53 GMT, to again, once we're just maintaining a constant orbital altitude below the station, except this time it was just about two and a half kilometers below. And that was a shorter burn, uh, lasting just about uh, 37 seconds. And so now we're getting into the approach initiation, and the approach initiation and the final stages. We're actually just about a minute and a half away from the AI burn. And at this point, we're into what's known as integrated operations between the Dragon Control Team here in Hawthorne and the Space Station Flight Controllers and Mission Control Houston. They made this transition after we hit what's called rendezvous complete. That essentially means that we've executed all of those major phasing burns, and the Dragon is now navigating towards the space station using what's called relative GPS. We'll talk through a couple of those uh, navigation items in a little bit, but we're about a minute away from that AI burn. Now, during approach, uh, SpaceX flight controllers will work in tandem with the NASA team in Houston to maneuver Dragon Freedom to the proper altitude and initialize the navigation sensors used for uh, the methodical approach to station. They'll also activate and test out a number of systems on Dragon, including bi-directional communications with the station using the C2V2 system. C2V2 stands for Common Communications for Visiting Vehicles. It sets up a data stream from Dragon to the station, giving another path for Dragon telemetry to come to ground and giving an additional command capability to astronauts aboard the station. And right now we're just 20 seconds or so away from this AI burn. So we should hear a call out up to the crew that it has started. And again, we're gonna be using these thrusters. Uh, we're only about two and a half kilometers below the station, about seven kilometers behind it. And this is gonna swing Dragon up until it's just about a quarter mile or about 400 meters directly below. Uh, and we just heard confirmation that the burn has started. So Dragon's now on its approach. So we're out of the rendezvous point. We're now approaching inside. We're gonna move inside one of the first imaginary checkpoints around the space station called the approach ellipsoid. And you'll hear it called uh, the AE on some of the operational comms. It's an imaginary shape around the space station. It's four kilometers by two kilometers by two kilometers. We a lot of times call it the pizza box. 
um, <laughs> and is essentially just a really large three-dimensional oval. And before Dragon is allowed to move inside that approach ellipsoid, uh, it's on what's known as a 24-hour safe trajectory or 24-hour free drift. And that just means that if Dragon lost all control to its thrusters, we know for at least 24 hours, its trajectory would not take it inside that approach ellipsoid. But now that we've executed that AI burn, we're moving inside that approach mm -hmm. ellipsoid. Dragon's now beginning its approach to the station. Yeah. Uh, now, the NASA and SpaceX teams will do a go, no-go poll to move Dragon inside that keep-out sphere. Another checkpoint that consists of an imaginary sphere around the station. Uh, it has a radius of 200 meters. Safe to say, we love imaginary shapes around the station. <laughs> <laughs> uh, flight controllers use this to monitor all arriving and departing vehicles. This is another chance to confirm all of the guidance, naviga navigation, and control systems are working correctly on Dragon before moving closer to the station. It carries a similar requirement on the orbital trajectory that if Dragon were to some... Dragon, SpaceX, on the big loop, AI burn complete and nominal. As a reminder, you may now review the impulsive retreat recovery cue cards as desired. All right, good news there. The live view of Dragon getting closer and closer to the International Space Station carrying the Crew 4 crew. Uh, that tracking camera does track Dragon uh, and it has to move every so often to keep Dragon in the view there. Yeah, we've, we've got a, a console called Cronus in Mission Control, and they are the video wizards for yeah, us. They super talented operators, for they, sure. They managed to snag views of Dragon a couple of hours ago, it sounded like. So I feel like they just keep trying to break their own record for how <laughs> soon they can see it. But uh, uh, getting some daylight views, seeing Dragon come into focus. Yeah. Um, so getting back to the imaginary shapes we were talking about. Um, so it carries a similar requirement on the orbital trajectory that if Dragon were to somehow lose control of its th thrusters, uh, it and the space station would be safe for four orbits or about six hours rather than the 24 hours required to enter the approach ellipsoid. Once Dragon arrives at 400 meters below station, it will be at what is known as waypoint zero and will be the first checkpoint during our approach. The vehicle can hold here at 400 meters, but if all of its systems, uh, for the, all that systems check out, uh, then we can continue to approach to waypoint one. Uh, right now, it looks like we're expecting to hit waypoint zero in about 44 minutes. Um, on the way there, Dragon will execute another maneuver called the mid-course burn. This just helps fine tune its approach. Uh, towards the space station. Uh, once we get through waypoint zero, though, we'll move on to waypoint one. And the, again, the joint NASA SpaceX teams are doing go, no goes for essentially the next waypoint before we hit the one we're headed towards. So before we get to waypoint zero, they'll do a joint go, no go to move on to waypoint one. And once we go from zero up to one, we're gonna swing up and out in front of the station and then arrive just over top of it at a distance of about 220 meters. So we'll still be outside that keep out sphere that Kate was talking about, but at that point we'll be on what's called the docking axis. So that just means we're pointing directly in front of our docking port. Uh, and for this flight, they're headed to the node two zenith port. That's the space facing side. Uh, the node two forward port already has a Dragon vehicle attached to it that carried crew three. Uh, and pretty soon we'll have two Dragons attached, uh, bringing the station crew up to 11. Uh, there's two international docking adapters on the station. They're no two forward, no two zenith of the space facing. Uh, and these were installed specifically for these new commercial space flights. Uh, they use what's known as the international docking standard. Um, so that's a standard that NASA developed with other partners around the world uh, to hopefully build a common docking mechanism or at least a set of standards for docking mechanisms for future spacecraft. Once Dragon is only 20 meters away at waypoint two, the spacecraft focuses on aligning its docking system with the international docking adapter that Dan was just talking about. Uh, we may hear the call out CHOP, which stands for Crew Hands Off Point, a little less than 30 seconds before docking. Uh, at this point, any aborts will then have to be done automatically by Dragon. And then the moment that we're all waiting for when the crew arrives at station, Dragon will fly in, it'll make contact with the international docking adapter, giving what we call soft capture. Uh, the soft capture ring has essentially some pedals uh, that 
drive into the uh, docking adapter and then the soft capture ring retracts until its sensors indicate the dragon's in a good spot. And then there's 12 hooks, two sets of six that drive uh, to give us hard capture and firmly secure dragon uh, to the International Space Station. And as if you've been following along, Shaniqua Vereen over in Mission Control Houston has been giving us the updates. We are expecting a docking a little bit earlier than expected. So we had already heard that uh, this is going to be one of the fastest rendezvous we've done yet on a Crew Dragon. And right now we're looking uh, at docking at about, let me pull up my time again real quick. While you do that, I'll just say that it's, uh, to my recollection, I could be wrong, it, I think this is the first time that we've done everything in one single calendar day. So, you know, <laughs> we launched early in the morning this morning, um, and and then now we're getting ready to dock here this afternoon, evening. Yeah, and that, that docking time right now, it's targeted, it's 440 Pacific, uh, 640 Central, um, that's about 1140 GMT. And so that's about 40 minutes earlier than what we were initially expecting. But on board the space station, the station crew is awake and they're ready to receive Dragon. Uh, NASA astronaut Tom Marshburn is lead for the monitoring duties and he's also gonna be the lead for all of the hatch operations. Um, so he's got equipment set up to monitor Dragon's approach inside uh, the space station's cupola. And once we get Dragon docked, he'll be the lead for essentially going through the steps we need to go through to get the hatch open. First, we have to pressurize the vestibule. That's that small space between Dragon's hatch and the station hatch. And he just opens up a small valve on the station side to just flow atmosphere in there. Uh, and then we won't be able to see it, but while that happens, umbilicals will connect two of them from station to Dragon. That integrates uh, Dragon into the station's power and data systems allowing it to not rely on its solar rays or batteries. It can just draw power from the station itself. So everything continuing to go smoothly so far. Uh, you did hear one item that got called up to the crew. The, the team here in Hawthorne was talking about a dragon eye uh, and some of the issues we've been tracking with it. Uh, the dragon eye is one of the uh, core pieces of navigation equipment that are used for a final approach and docking. It's, we have two of them on Dragon, and they essentially use uh, LIDAR bouncing lasers off of reflectors on the station, uh, as well as thermal imagers to get range, range rate information that feeds back into uh, Dragon's flight computer in real time. And we've had a couple of issues when they do what's called a built-in test, just a check out of those Dragon Eyes with one of them, Dragon Eye 1. Uh, after additional analysis, the teams have essentially decide, determined that uh, the test is failing as it's overly sensitive. Uh, it's passed several of the tests, but uh, again, that is one of the critical items that we use during that final approach. So they've told the crew we have a forward plan. Uh, we only need one of those to do the final rendezvous and docking. And so if any issues do crop up with Dragon I-1, we can use Dragon I-2 for uh, all of our final approach operations. And so that's the only item we've been tracking uh, for the ascent so far today. And at this point, we're still all systems go for the docking. So we just, we did, just did that approach initiation maneuver and next up's gonna be that mid-course burn. Now we did mention that we launched earlier this morning in the, the wee hours of the night just after uh, midnight. So uh, we launched at 12.52 a.m. Pacific time, uh, 7.52 Eastern. And uh, up until this point, uh, the crew has gone through a sleep period. Of course, everything is super scheduled, whether you're on station or in a Dragon, um, you know, the crew has to be ready to go whenever they get on station, particularly for the, the upcoming docking activities. So they have gone through their sleep phase. Um, they've had their they have two meals at this point. Uh, and yeah, as Dan said, we're, we're getting ready to uh, enter the docking phases here. That's a live view of the Dragon Freedom capsule. Um, it seems like it's moving fast because it is. <laughs> that tracking camera has to keep playing catch up with the capsule. Of course, you know, in orbit, they're going 17,500 miles per hour. 
um, in order to meet the space station. So, um, yeah, things are moving pretty quickly. Yeah, and Dragon's still closing in. Right now it's a little over five kilometers away from the space station still. We'll execute that mid-course maneuver. And then once we hit waypoint zero, that's our first waypoint during the final approach, we'll just be 400 meters away. So we'll be directly beneath the space station uh, and inside the approach ellipsoid, still outside the keep out sphere. Uh, it's closing in right now at a rate of just about four and a half meters per second. So things are definitely slow and steady during the approach, uh, during the actual final approach into docking uh, Dragon will slow down to less than a tenth of a meter per second. Um, and then, all, again, all of this is being done automatically. Dragon's flight computers have been in control of this mission essentially since liftoff. Uh, and it's been constantly recalculating all of the different burn times on the way uphill uh, and then feeding its own, basically, planning systems uh, to calculate how long the next burn will be what time that's going to happen. And thanks to a pretty efficient flight uphill today, we're going to be able to dock early. So we just passed under five kilometers away. Just a one quick point of clarification that Dragon I-1 failed two tests early on, those built-in tests, um, but has passed all recent tests. Um, we have redundancy with uh, Dragon I-1 and Dragon I-2, uh, they, are, they are both passing. So at this moment, we're still, we're coming up on that mid-course burn. That'll be in a little over 13 minutes from now. Uh, Dragon uses the Draco thrusters to execute all of these maneuvers. Um, there's 16 of those on the Dragon spacecraft. There's 12 clustered around what we call the service section. That's just the lower part of the capsule, not on the trunk, uh, but still integrated into the capsule. And there's uh, four clusters of three around the service section. Uh, and then there's also what we call the forward bulkhead thrusters. And those are uh, four that are hidden by the nose cone during ascent, but once we get that open, uh, they're unveiled. And the ones in the forward bulkhead do a lot of the pushing maneuvers. So when we're doing those long burns uh, to raise our orbit up, that's being handled by those forward bulkhead thrusters. And then the ones around the service section are doing a lot of your attitude control and what we call translational moves, so moving side to side, up, down. Um, and depending on the lighting conditions, usually during the final approach, when you start to see the plumes shooting out of Dragon, it's going from those service section Dracos. And uh, each one of those provides about 90 pounds uh, force of thrust. So definitely not in the neighborhood of what you see on a Falcon 9 uh, or even the Super Dracos, but uh, that is more than enough uh, to, to do your orbital maneuvers in uh, while, while you're in the vacuum. Um, this, is, this is a pretty cool view. So on the left here, uh, we're looking at one of the cameras on the space station. Uh, the very bottom and kind of that big gold panel you see, that's the solar flex solar array uh, on the Cygnus cargo craft. Uh, that's one of the U.S. commercial cargo craft currently berthed to the space station. Uh, and then just behind that, I have to look at my charts, but that's either a Soyuz or a Russian Progress. I believe that's a Soyuz dock to the... And SpaceX Freedom on Dragon to Ground. SpaceX, ready to copy. Okay, we got the uh, cabin situated. Uh, we've got four suited crew members and good intercom checks. Okay, copy all. Completion of suit donning. We on the ground are ready for suit leak checks, so you are go for 4.011. At this time, we are also looking for a go to bring cameras back on board. Okay, copy that. You have the
have a go uh, to bring cameras on board, and uh, we have a go for 4.011 leak checks. Good read back. All right, so at this point in time, crew four, crew members have put their suits back on or donned, as you heard it called, uh, and they are getting back into their seats, putting those safety harnesses back on, and we will perform a leak check on those suits just to make sure that everything is connecting uh, to the umbilicals prop properly. Those umbilicals provide um, telemetry and cool air and uh, communications uh, to the Dragon spacecraft from the suits themselves. So the suit is basically an extension of the spacecraft um, while they're while they're seated in their in their seats and buckled in. All right, so we are just under 10 minutes away from that, that mid-course burn. That's just, again, that's a very small maneuver uh, done as Dragon moves from the start of its approach initiation up to waypoint zero. So that'll be just a quick firing. And then after that, we'll be about 20 minutes away from the arrival at our first waypoint. That'll place Dragon just about 400 meters directly below the space station. Um, so we do have a bit of time until we get through all those other phases of docking. And so we'll try uh, and take some of your questions if you want to use the hashtag AskNASA. If you have any questions about Dragon, anything about the approach, anything like that, head over to Twitter, use that hashtag AskNASA, and we'll try to get through a couple. And SpaceX Freedom uh, crew is ready to pressurize. Freedom SpaceX, go for suit pressurization. And Freedom Copy, go for suit pressurization in work. All right, and as Kate was talking about, so the crew, they're, they're getting suited up. They're going to do another leak check. They've, they've done several of these <laughs> in the last 24 hours. We saw them uh, do it inside the suit-up room uh, when they first got suited up with the SpaceX team. Uh, did it again after they climbed into Dragon uh, while we were still on the pad before we got into Ascent. And now they're going to do them again as they're going to be in these suits for all of the rendezvous and docking. And then once we dock, they'll be able to get out. Yeah. And that doesn't even count, you know, the dry dress rehearsal that we did right. uh, a couple, gosh, time is really wonky this week with all the crew activity that we've had here. Um, but I'll just say at some point within the last several days, <laughs> dry dress occurred. And uh, yeah, they went through all those same steps again, basically practicing as if they were going to space, um, minus the part where, you know, the rocket Launching. actually takes yeah. off. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so they'll, they'll get through that leak check and then they'll, they'll remain in the suits until they're docked to the space station. They don't keep the suits pressurized the entire time. Uh, they'll seal them up, have visors down for the leak check, and then they'll uh, essentially get into their quiescent configuration where the crew can essentially open up a zipper, leave the suit unsealed, and they'll just be flowing conditioned or cooled cabin air through the suits just to keep them cool as they're in those seats. I will only pressurize the suits uh, if they're needed uh, to respond to any kind of off nominal situation. But just checking in on times real quick. We're a little over seven, minute, seven minutes away from the mid course burn. And then we expect to hit waypoint zero in about 28 minutes from now. Uh, and again, we're just a little over, or a little under an hour and a half away from our expected docking time, though. And so Dragon's going to continue to approach. It'll hit waypoint zero. And again, it'll be just about 400 meters below the space station. It might hang out there, but if the teams give the joint go uh, before that, they'll move right, right through waypoint zero and start to move towards waypoint one, uh, which will have Dragon essentially do a 180 degree maneuver around the space station, going from directly below to directly above. And at that point, they'll be on what's known as the docking axis, lined up with their docking port on the space-facing side of node two. And then they'll be ready to begin that final approach.
But everything continuing to look great. Let's check in with the space station. Hey, Freedom, uh, we're showing four nominal leak checks. Freedom, SpaceX on Dragon at Ground, we see the same. Four good leak checks. Next up, mid course maneuver in just over five minutes. Freedom, copy. All right, four good suit leak checks reported by the crew, confirmed by the ground. And next up's that mid-course maneuver in just under five and a half minutes. So let's jump over to Shaniqua Vereen, who's standing by with the teams in Mission Control Houston, leading our joint operations for today. Over to you, Shaniqua. Thanks, Dan, and welcome back to Mission Control Houston at NASA's Johnson Space Center. We're currently being led by Flight Director Adi Bulos, and to his right is Capcom Alex Kanalinkos. Currently, we're monitoring the ISS, and crew is awake and preparing for Crew Dragon's arrival. Current station commander, Tom Marshburn, is going to be prime or the main person monitoring Dragon's approach from the station's cupola. He will be using and setting up special software to track Dragon's approach and making sure it stays in the expected zones. Once Dragon is docked, Marshburn will be primed to start hatch opening operations. He'll start by opening the large hatch on node 2 Zenith, giving access into the pressurized mating adapter. The crew will then have to pressurize the vestibule, which is that small space between the hatches on the Dragon and the space station. This was exposed to vacuum prior to docking, so the crew will need to fill it with air and make sure it's pressurized to nearly equal the atmospheric pressure on Dragon and the station. Marshburn will use a small valve on the station's hatch to solely introduce air into the station's vestibule. Flight controllers here in Houston will monitor the, and ver verify the pressure readings here to make sure that everything is leak-free before we get ready to open those hatches. Again, everything looking good over here on Mission Control Houston, and we're still on our way and ready for Crew 4's arrival. Again, we're ex excited to see those Crew 4 astronauts aboard the station, and we're excited to get our Crew 4 astronauts aboard the station, and we're working on handover between Crew 4 and Crew 3 astronauts who are set to undock uh, just five days from now. That's the latest from here in Mission Control Houston. Now back over to you, Hawthorne. All right, thanks, Shaniqua. Uh, glad to hear everything's still looking good on the station side. Uh, and excited also here to see uh, another Dragon dock to the space station. We're pretty soon we're gonna have 11 people on board the space station at once, so it'll be a packed house for a couple of days. Uh, they'll do the direct handover, and then it's time for Crew 3 to come home. Yeah, the fun's not done with Crew 4, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're very much looking forward to bringing Crew 3 crew home. Um, you know, they've been up there for a while, and I'm sure they're ready to come home and, and see their families. Uh, but yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, it's been certainly a busy week. Uh, we had the Axiom 1 crew return from station earlier this week, um, and then, of course, lift off and hopefully, hopefully soon docking for the Crew 4 crew. Uh, and yeah, wrapping up a dynamic week of astronaut missions here at SpaceX. <laughs> yeah, uh, and as was talked a, a little bit earlier, I guess it was th still this morning, uh, we're looking at about May 4th for that Crew 3 departure, uh, which will set them up for a splashdown on May 5th. Biggest item is gonna be weather. That was what we were all watching with AX1 and ended up prolonging their stay by a couple of days. Uh, and. Same as with launches, Florida weather is always something you got to work around, uh, but the teams will be keeping an eye. Initial reports looking like we should have some solid chances next week to bring Crew 3 home. May the 4th be with them. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I had to. I had to. Nice. All right. So if you look closely at that shot there, you can see Dragon. Yeah, now we're zooming in. Cronus read your mind. <laughs> and... Uh, once again, it is moving quickly, so the tracking camera has to reposition every once in a while. But yeah, very, very cool there to see, um, you know, 
I mean, the reality is that we have a couple of hours to go before we complete docking. You know, we're targeting a docking completion around uh, quarter to five here Pacific, so around 4.45-ish um, time-wise. So we've got a little ways to go, uh, about a little over an hour. Uh, but the point being is that Dragon is getting closer and closer, so the tracking cameras are um, able to keep zooming back and give us that, that perspective shot. Yeah, right now Dragon about 1,800 meters away and still closing in, and we should be coming up on that mid-course burn in about 20 seconds. This will be a real short firing, um, just typically a couple of seconds on those Draco thrusters to just really fine-tune that approach. Uh, up until we hit waypoint zero. You can contrast that with the approach burn, which broke Dragon out of that co-elliptic orbit with the station and started to swing it up. At that point, we were still about seven and a half kilometers behind the space station, and that was about a 90 second thruster firing. And so this will just be a real quick one. Uh, we should be hearing that call out any moment now. All right, and so we did get confirmation the mid-course burn has started. And then as and then as usual, we'll get uh, a call typically from the core up to the crew uh, on that burn performance. Once again, this burn is done about halfway from our starting point of uh, approach initiation to waypoint zero. Just a small burn to fine tune our approach while, uh, you know, to ensure that we're still targeting a precise uh, 400 meters directly below the station. And at this point, we should be hitting waypoint zero in just a little under 20 minutes. And Dragon still navigating autonomously. And should be hearing a call out. Dragon, SpaceX on the big loop. Mid-course correction maneuver complete and nominal. Trajectory converged on waypoint zero. All right, and there you have it, good mid-course burn. Just a little over 19 minutes and change away from our arrival at waypoint zero. One other item of note is we were talking about it. Uh, those Dragon Eyes did get another quick checkout uh, shortly after that mid-course burn started. Teams confirmed both Dragon Eyes working as expected. Um, they had already passed, they both passed several of those tests previously. Uh, we did have a couple of failures on Dragon I-1, uh, but again, teams thoroughly understood it. We had the redundancy built in. We just did another test, uh, and both of those Dragon Eyes are checked out and ready for use. We only need one of them for the final approach and docking, so we've got plenty of redundancy uh, for this final approach at this point. There's our first live view of inside Dragon Freedom with the Crew 4 crew. This is our first live view uh, since we left them earlier uh, for that media event. They are now, as you can see, in their spacesuits with their visors up. They are in their seats, buckled in. And for the crew, they're, they're largely just in a monitor mode. Um, they have the capability to Again, send commands to Dragon, take manual control of the vehicle. Uh, but on a nominal flight, Dragon's flight computers are doing all of the flying, and it's got just a suite of different navigational tools at its disposal, um, inertial measurement units. You've got those Dragon eyes literally bouncing lasers off of the space station. Uh, since we ended the rendezvous mode, we're navigating with what's called relative GPS, so a global positioning system. You've got antennas on the space station, receivers on Dragon that are talking to each other, uh, and we've got that C2V2 uh, set up as well that Kate was discussing, uh, and that's allowing us to send data, video, communications 
uh, directly between the Dragon, the space station, and the ground. Um, and you're going to hear what's called the big loop uh, discussed a lot. Uh, up until this point, the core here in Hawthorne's been talking to the Dragon crew on Dragon to Ground. That's that direct communication line. Uh, and the team in Houston talks to the station on Space to Ground. So we have several, we have four of those that they can talk across. When we get into these integrated operations, we tie everybody together. Everybody hears everything big, everybody else family. is saying. <laughs> One big happy family. We call it the big loop. Um, and so that's what we'll hear all of our comms on for the remainder of the approach. So that view there on the right hand side, that camera is positioned between our commander and our pilot. So Commander Chell Lindgren is on the left hand side and pilot Bob Hines is on the right hand side. As Dan said, Dragon is fully autonomous. It's flying itself at this point, uh, which in reality is much safer than humans controlling it. Uh, you know, our computers and our systems are able to take all the inputs, evaluate, and correct, adjust, fly, essentially, um, much faster and much safer than if there was a steering wheel on Dragon, per se. You can see that the nose cone is open, and we can see that forward hatch is exposed. That is the hatch that will be utilized to dock autonomously with the space station here in just over an hour. And a lot of the instruments that we're using for this approach are in that section that the nose cone covers. Um, it's closed during the ascent, the flight up to orbit. We also closed it at the very end of the mission just to provide some additional protection because you have essentially optical equipment, things like that, that are in the nose cone. And so you just want to protect them from all of the stresses of a launch or a reentry. Uh, you also have the docking ring. As Kate was saying, that's what's going to uh, be that attachment point. Um, if you tuned into the launch broadcast, uh, Jesse and I got to walk people through a hatch mock-up, so that was always really cool. Uh, continuing to do my own astronaut training bit by bit every time <laughs> we do one of these shows. Uh, but that, that forward hatch has a lot of really critical items built into it. Um, it can be open from either side. There's an identical uh, crank mechanism, both on the inside and the outside of the hatch. Uh, and so that's what they'll operate once we get to hatch opening after we pressurize the vestibule. Um, that hatch also has a pressure equalization valve so they can essentially manually, uh, if needed, ensure that the pressure between the Dragon cabin and the station cabin are the same before we open the hatch. That all gets done through a different set of valves, uh, but that forward hatch has that additional capability if it's required. Dragon, SpaceX on the big loop. Ground has pulled go for approach zero, and we will enable the maneuver shortly. Expected start time is 2241 UTC. Dragon will continue approach through waypoint one toward waypoint two. All right, so that's great news. So we, we talked through some of the waypoints and how uh, we can either stop at them or we can just keep going. And the call we just got is we're just going to keep going. So they're going to hit waypoint zero, just 400 meters below the station, and then they're going to move on to waypoint one. Mm -hmm. Now, as Dan said earlier, everything is carefully choreographed. Um, the imaginary shapes that we keep talking about around station are important because uh, everything has to be super choreographed. All teams, both the ones that you see on your screen now, there at Mission Control Center here in Hawthorne, California, that's located just behind Dan and I. Uh, those teams, as well as the teams at Mission Control Center at Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, uh, as well as the teams on station and the team inside the Dragon capsule. Um, you know, these, these waypoint check-ins are basically to make sure that everyone is aligned. Um, I like to think of it that it's kind of similar to our countdown clock when we're getting ready to launch a rocket. That countdown is the thing that syncs up all teams to the same timeline and everybody knows at what step we're about to walk into or where we completed 
Um, for example, you know, prop load at T minus 35 minutes. We know that's what we're working towards. Um, so I like to think these waypoints, while the specific times are targeted, as Dan said before, we're running a little early, and we're, as we just heard, we're, gonna, we're not gonna stop, we're just gonna keep going. Um, while the times are not necessarily set in stone, like things are for the countdown clock of day of launch, um, these are certainly checkpoints um, and a other type of countdown uh, that all teams use, both on ground and in space, to align the work that is being done. Um, everything, literally just, have we done this? Yep, check, done. And I, one of the one of the nice things about the rendezvous and approach, uh, there is no instantaneous docking time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we ha we have a window essentially, um, where if you run into any kind of an issue, you can hang out and solve that issue. You don't have to, you know, scrub and try the next day. Uh, we saw that during the AX1 approach, and they were able to still dock. All right, here we go. So on the left. That's station looking at Dragon. On the right, that's Dragon looking up at station. And there's a number of cameras in the, the very forward part of Dragon. Um, one is essentially called the media camera. It's just a visible light camera that's not part of the actual navigation system, but uh, does provide video. And that video can be used by the crew on board the station with some special overlays uh, for their monitoring task. Uh, and then there's a number of other sensors, the Dragon Eye, like we talked about, uh, using LiDAR and uh, thermal imaging. Um, and then there's also a centerline docking camera. That's the one that uh, the crew on board station uh, can get video of, uh, routed to essentially laptops just on the station that have a special overlay uh, that helps them gauge Dragon's positioning and during its final approach. Yeah. And there's the space station. And we're we're coming up just directly underneath it. So you're you're looking up at station essentially from Dragon, and that's just outer space directly behind us. Um, and Dragon's going to continue to fly straight up at this point uh, for about 10 more minutes until we hit waypoint zero. We're just about 640 meters now away from the station. And uh, as I said earlier, its speeds are going to start to slow down more and more. We're, we're actually closing at less than a meter per second right now. So it's, again, just very uh, slow, methodical approach as Dragon makes its way upward. Once again, that's a live view there on the right-hand side of Commander Bob Hines on the right and Commander Chell Lindgren on the left. I love that view. I love being able to see what the astronauts are seeing on their screens, what they're using. As we mentioned before, Dragon is autonomous. It's flying itself right now, but the crew has been trained extensively in order to act as a backup of that system. Um, but they are monitoring along with progress and everything that's going on. Um, one of those screens actually has a visualization of the Dragon capsule and shows which thruster is um, is ignited at any point in time. So there, that is the top of Dragon that we're seeing. The in between the red and the green lights, there's a center light um, that is actually light coming from the interior of the Dragon capsule. <laughs> That's a tiny little window there on the forward hatch. And if you're wondering why it looks like somebody turned the lights out, we are on the dark side of planet Earth now. We entered into an orbital sunset. Uh, Station and Dragon right now are orbiting uh, just a little over 430 kilometers, um, so about 260 statute miles over the southern Atlantic Ocean. They just swung out over the very southern part of South America and are about to swing up to the northeast and pass right over Central Africa. So it's dark right now. Uh, but again, Dragon has sensors able to work in light and dark. Um, the, the visible cameras, you can use uh, thermal imaging, so uh, they're going to work regardless of your lighting conditions. And we're going to continue to be in sunset, or in darkness essentially, um, for about 30 more minutes. Um, we should see that sunrise hit them 
uh, at about 4.05 Pacific, um, just about 30 minutes before our anticipated docking time. As we've said uh, before, we are taking your questions from social media. Be sure to tweet at us using the hashtag AskNASA. Uh, we do have one question. Uh, Dan, I'm going to pitch this one to you. All right. Uh, this comes to us from at Kristen Bragg. What will the astronauts be working on in the space station on this mission, and how many days will they be on the space station? Well, they'll be working on a lot of different things. There's no mission is ever the exact same as the one before it. Um, and everyone is just packed with a diverse number of activities. Uh, primarily, they're doing a lot of research. So we have research in multiple disciplines, everything from developing uh, medicines, health technologies, things for just us back down here on Earth. Uh, a lot of that coming through the International Space Station National Lab. So about 50% of all of the research that we have on the U.S. allocation goes to academia, to companies that want to do research in microgravity. And all of that is focused on benefiting us back here on Earth. Uh, aside from that, we do a lot of research on the station for exploration purposes. I mean, the station is where we've learned how to live in space for extremely long periods of time. We just, had, we just had Mark Van de Heij come home after 355 days. And so everything we're going to do when we go onto the moon, yeah. when you go to Mars and you're talking about nine months just to get there, you have to learn how to keep people safe, healthy, you have to develop life support systems, food systems, everything that goes into a mission that you're going to have to bring with you. And you don't want to test it the first time you're on your way to Mars. Yep. You want to test it while you're actually close to home still. And we do that all on board the space station. And then as far as how long they'll stay, we don't have an exact day count. Um, as we just saw in the Axia mission, you have an approximate <laughs> time that you expect. And then launch times, weather, all of that ends up changing that. Uh, typical space station flights are about six months. So we would expect crew five, uh, crew five, crew four, we're on crew four to come <laughs> home uh, in the fall time frame this year. Yeah. Now you did mention Mark Van de Heij earlier. Now that 355 days was a, a new record for a single yeah. stay for a NASA astronaut, right? Yeah, it was. It was. He went up there, and it wasn't originally intended to be that long, uh, but once he was up there, we were able to essentially extend his stay, and Mark was fully on board. Um, okay. And that's something that we did uh, pretty famously with Scott Kelly in his one-year mission. That was the first time uh, we had an American stay that long in outer space. Since then, we've had a couple of really long ones. We had Peggy Whitson's uh, really long mission. Uh, Christina Cook, Andrew Morgan did extended stays, and then Mark Van de Heij just set the record with 355 days. And that's almost a year. Almost a year in outer space. And we, we know a tremendous amount about what happens to humans when they spend about six months in space. We don't necessarily know as much when you're pushing that out to eight months, nine months, a year. And that's something, like I said, when we go to Mars, you're looking at about nine months one way. And so you really have to have a good handle on what else does the human body do when it's in microgravity that long? And how can Absolutely. we keep our people healthy? Yeah, it's pretty incredible to, to be able to facilitate that exploration and yeah. that learning through these operational crew missions, these long duration missions to the International Space Station. Um, now, we, we are, for those of you that have just joined us, um, the crew launched earlier today, uh, just after midnight here, and um, just after midnight for those of us here on the West Coast, yep. um, and the, uh, the crew is now in the Dragon capsule that you see on your screen. Uh, they are in their seats, buckled in, uh, connected to their seats themselves, uh, in their spacesuits. Uh, they have not closed the visors for um, pressurization. We did do the pressurization for the, the leak check earlier, got a good leak check, um, and that was really the, the beginning of this approach um, that we are currently undergoing. Uh, we are expecting to make contact with the space station around 4.30-ish 
uh, Pacific time. So that is just under an hour from now. Um, we might be running a little bit early because, as Dan mentioned before, we heard the call out that um, we're just, we're just going to cruise right on through uh, Waypoint Zero uh, and possibly Waypoint One. So um, we are, are uh, underway with that now. Yep, and we're just about two minutes away from Waypoint Zero, so that'll be our first waypoint in the approach. Um, and we'll be just 400 meters below station. Um, and I don't know if we can slip it in, but I did see we, we got another social question. This is one that comes up a lot. What are the red and the green lights? Why does it look like it's Christmas in space right now? <laughs> uh, and those are just lights to help tell the observers on the station and those on the ground which side of Dragon. Those just essentially signify which side's port, which side's starboard uh, for the Dragon spacecraft. And that's done so when we're in darkness, uh, you just have better spatial awareness of what part of Dragon you're looking at. For sure. Um, also important to note, other vessels do the same thing. Airplanes also utilize red and green lights to indicate, what, again, which is port and which is starboard, as well as ships. So um, basically, it's important to know which side is which, uh, especially right now as we are approaching the space station. And as, as we can see, as Dan said earlier, the lights are off. <laughs> so it's helpful to understand the orientation. Um, now, the sensors on Dragon, uh, those Dragon eyes, they don't need the lights on in order to do their job. We are using LiDAR and thermal imaging um, to track the station and make this very controlled and slow approach to station. Uh, basically, those Dragon eyes, <coughs> excuse me, are locked into uh, a specific spot with the space station, that docking area, and uh, is making a slow approach. And uh, yeah, we can see that that center white light, as I mentioned before, that's actually a tiny little window on the, on the forward hatch. That's actually the uh, interior lights inside Dragon Freedom. And we should be coming up on waypoint zero in about 20 seconds. And as we heard the call up to the crew, we're not gonna be stopping here. Uh, we're just going to continue on through Waypoint Zero, and then we should also be continuing through Waypoint One. Um, so we're going to wait for the call out for Waypoint Zero. Oh. And we can see those Draco thrusters around the service section firing. That's pretty spectacular. I love that. And so Waypoint Zero has been passed. Dragon's now inside 400 meters away from the space station and it's moving up to what's known as waypoint one and so we can see those thrusters firing dragon is essentially doing a flip over to the top side of the station so it's moving from 400 meters directly below to an area just 220 meters directly above and once it gets there it'll be on what we call the docking axis so it'll be lined up directly with the docking port on the space-facing side of Note 2, the Harmony module, uh, just about 220 meters away. And we'll, we have the go to then move through Waypoint 1 and move to Waypoint 2, which will move us inside of that keep-out sphere. This is a great uh, illustration of what we're doing. So Waypoint Zero is at the bottom, Dragon's following that line out in front and over to the top part of station where it'll pause just momentarily at Waypoint One, 220 meters away, and then it'll start to drive straight down towards Waypoint Two, and that'll put it just 20 meters away. We'll essentially always hold at Waypoint Two. That's where the teams do their final go-no-go -no -go for final approach and docking. Um, and so Dragon will just be positioned just 20 meters away. It'll then start to push in, again, moving at a pretty glacial rate of less than a tenth of a meter per second until we get to that initial contact and capture. Dragon, SpaceX on the big loop. Approach zero is in progress. Trajectory has converged on waypoint one. We predict waypoint one arrival at approximately 2321. UTC. So the call up to the crew, letting them know we've moved through waypoint zero, trajectories converged, so we're locked on to waypoint one, that space, or that point just 220 meters directly above the space station. We expect to be there in about 37 and a half minutes. 
So we'll continue to see Dragon just slowly make its way again out in front of the station and then flying up directly overhead. Dan, you mentioned earlier that we're gonna be in the dark for a while. Um, do you know how much time we have left? I'm asking selfishly because I really wanna see those thrusters fire again in the dark. Uh, that was such an awesome view to be able to see those Draco thrusters uh, as they were powering through Waypoint Zero. Yeah, we've got about 22 minutes left in the dark, so we'll be in an orbital daytime by the time we hit Waypoint Zero. Um, we should see a couple more thruster firings as it, as it makes it as, again, we're, we're kind of doing a loop. We're staying outside the keep out sphere and swinging up and around in front. And this is the view from Dragon looking at the space station. You could see uh, several of the large radiators uh, on the space station. And now we're back inside with the crew and a couple of the items that they're looking at. So on the far left, uh, that is essentially the centerline camera. So that is the view that they have to monitor their approach to the space station. That's also uh, the screen that Chell Lindgren as the commander or Bob Hines as the pilot could use to manually fly the vehicle if necessary. Uh, and then that screen in the middle is just showing them their trajectory. I think I just saw another firing. Or we're getting some lighting artifacts, it looks like. Yeah, so I'll point out, we were just talking about the red and green lights. I, as I mentioned before, that center white light, um, not the blinking one, the one that stays on, that is a tiny window uh, on the forward hatch. And then the two lights that are on the right-hand side, those are actually Dragon's windows. So the side hatch is located in between those two uh, side white lights. Safe to say that if I were in a Dragon capsule in space, my face would be plastered up against the window the whole time. I mean, the core would have to yell at me to get back in my seat. Uh, that's where I would be. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, they're, they're seated the whole time for this approach, but uh, we did do a fly around on the, I, think, I believe it was the Crew 2 departure, uh, where some of the crew were able to get out of their seats and take photos of the space station as Dragon just executed a loop around it. Um, so that you know, had to have been a pretty spectacular uh, job for them to do right before they came home. But so in this view, we're looking, we're looking up at the space station, those kind of ruffled uh, items you can see. Those are some of the large radiators that we use to reject heat generated uh, by all of the different electronics uh, and systems on board the space station. That screen in the middle uh, is showing the crew their trajectory, so their flight, their relative position around the space station. Uh, the station itself is in the center of that kind of cross uh, in the top right of that screen. And then you can see uh, the circle around it. That's just indicative of the keep out sphere. And then you'll see that triangle part. Um, that is what's called the approach corridor. And that's just essentially the imaginary shape that they're wanting to stay in during that final approach. And they're able to monitor that on Dragon. They're able to monitor that down here on the ground in MCCX. Uh, and Tom Marshburn and the crew on board the station have that, essentially that same overlay uh, and able to track from on board the space station. Now this is a cool juxtaposition of views because they're looking at each other right now. <laughs> so on the left, uh, of course, is that Dragon capsule as it keeps moving and on the right hand side was the station so that view of station is coming from that point on dragon that we can see as we've mentioned before dragon is completely autonomous it's flying itself uh, and the the crew on board are monitoring they're standing by um, they have been trained extensively in order to be able to take over uh, if necessary uh, they they're basically the primary backup to the system um, but uh, everything is continuing along nominally as we've said before um, we actually instead of stopping at waypoint zero everything looked good so we just kind of cruised on through and we'll probably be able to do that with waypoint one um, so we're just like we said, this this was already shaping up to be the fastest trip from uh, from launch to docking, uh, and Dragon is just continuing to make that even shorter. 
Um, so our, our initial target docking time uh, was about 8.15 over on the East Coast, uh, and that's uh, moved up uh, almost an hour. Um, our docking time right now, we should be less than an hour away. Uh, the current target was about 4.40 uh, Pacific, uh, which is about 11.40 GMT. And Dragon's flight computer, again, making those adjustments in real time as it gathers all of the different relative navigation data from Dragon Eye and the different sensors on board and just continuing to fine tune its path and uh, update in real time. But as Kate said, everything's going really smooth so far with this approach. Uh, we have no impediments to docking that we're tracking and we're just standing by until we hit waypoint one. We should be there in about 30 minutes, a little over 31 minutes from now. Uh, at which point they'll be directly above the space station. Yeah, as we said before, um, this movement from waypoint zero to waypoint one essentially swings Dragon up and out in front of the space station, um, at, at which point it'll reach about 220 meters away from station. Um, it's at that point in time, it'll be on what is referred to as the docking axis. Uh, which essentially means it's directly in front of the docking port that it is targeting to dock at. As we said, once once Dragon docks, it's going to be a pretty full house on station for a little less than a week. We'll have two Dragon vehicles uh, docked, the one that's now delivering Crew 4 and the one that delivered Crew 3 back in November of last year. Um, so both of our international docking ports will be taken up. Uh, we've got one Soyuz spacecraft that's currently docked to the Russian node module, uh, along with two uncrewed Progress and that uh, Cygnus that we saw uh, that's currently birthed. Uh, as we mentioned throughout the webcast, we're taking your, your questions from social media uh, using the hashtag AskNASA. Uh, we have a new one coming in, which is pretty on point for what you were just talking about, Dan. So I'm going to throw this one to you. This comes to us from at TLPN underscore official, the launch pad. Uh, the question is, how many bedrooms are there on station? Where will the extra crew be sleeping? Yeah, right now we have, let me do the math in my head, we have seven bedrooms essentially on board the station. We have two in the Russian segment, uh, four in node two, uh, and then one in the European, the Columbus, we call it the CASA. I forget what the acronym is, but I feel like that was another one. They made up the acronym and then <laughs> filled it in. Um, so we've only got seven, and they're called crew quarters. They're essentially the size of a small closet, and that's your private space to yourself when you're living on board the space station. And so we're going to have 11 people on board for a short time, and so we do what we call camp-out positions, where uh, they just set up temporary sleep areas where you can basically affix your sleeping bag to the wall. Uh, right, typically, there's microgravity, right? So it's not like you have to lay out a bed or anything. You sleep just sleep on the wall, floor, yeah. <laughs> every, everything's a bed essentially. Uh, we'll typically have one crew member stay inside the Dragon spacecraft. Um, so I anticipate one of the crew members from uh, either Crew 3 or Crew 4 will be sleeping in a Dragon. Uh, we'll usually put one inside the Quest airlock as that's when we're not actively doing spacewalks. That's one of the lowest traffic areas. Um, and then we'll just typically find us another space either in the Japanese module, uh, Kibo, or also inside Columbus uh, where we can have them set up shop for a couple of days. That's pretty intriguing to see how, uh, you know, space is rearranged, flexed, depending on the number of visitors. Uh, and I always I always love seeing photos from uh, the lucky individuals that get to sleep inside Dragon because, again, microgravity, uh, you know, inside the capsule, it, it, it is a little congested in terms of you have the seats there, but you can actually remove the foot bar, so like the foot rest itself, and it creates a lot of extra space. Um, and, you know, you just Velcro yourself to something and, and yeah. you're comfortable. 
Like, and we've got another one. I, I like this question. Uh, so this one came in from Jordan T. Wanted to know what's the usual cabin temp or pr and pressure for Dragon and the space station. And so uh, it's cabin temps adjustable uh, based off the crew preference. Uh, we actually a little while after launch we heard, and it's it's unusual because the crew can't always just adjust the thermostat on their own, either on Dragon or on the space station. It's actually somebody on the ground mm -hmm. um, who has to control that for station. It's our ethos console that oversees all of our life support and it's one of our CIS positions uh, in Hawthorne, but they'll keep it usually in around the seventies. System, system, correct? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, usually in the seventies, again, it's, it's total crew preference, um, but they can control the temperature and the relative humidity on board. Uh, in terms of pressure, it's right at around where we are at sea level. So about 14.7 PSI. It's usually a little bit less than that, uh, but we keep it at that pressure just so you're not in a drastically different pressure when you're on station than when you are here on Earth. And so we can maintain that pressurized environment. It might be off by a little bit, like a couple of decimal points of PSI between the two spacecraft after they dock. And that's why we do that equalization. So by the time we open up the hatch, pressure is essentially the same on either side. Hatch just comes right open and you don't have to fight against any extra air pressure or anything like that. Yeah. Now, another form of uh, temperature control that we utilize is actually in the spacesuits themselves. Uh, so while the astronauts are in their suits and, and uh, they have their umbilicals plugged into their seats inside Dragon, uh, we actually flow a little bit of nitrox or nitrogen oxygen, which is an air mixture, same as what you use whenever you go scuba diving. Um, and so totally fine to breathe. And it's also what is flowed through the suit whenever their visor is closed and in, in that locked position during dynamic events inside the capsule. Um, but that cool air is essentially flowing through the suit at all times. So um, while the cabin temperature is adjustable, so is the the temperature inside the suit, which, uh, you know, I could imagine that going to space would be pretty exciting. Um, you know, sweat might happen and having that, <laughs> that cold, not cold, that cooler air flowing through the suit helps keep everybody comfortable and uh, not smelly. Yeah. All right, we'll get video back in a little bit. We're still about 25 minutes away from Waypoint One. We've got another question. This from from at Lou Angeles. Do the sleeping quarters have windows? Great question. Unfortunately, no for most of them. The, the dragon two, ones do. Yeah. The dragon mm -hmm. does. Uh, the dragon's got those windows. So yep. when you're staying in Dragon, uh, you've got a window to look out. Uh, and then our sleeping quarters in the Russian segment have a window. Uh, but all the ones in the U.S. side, unfortunately, do not. Um, I could imagine that could be a little bit harder to sleep with because, again, you're you're traveling at about 17,000 miles an hour. You're seeing sunrises and sunsets. So unless you've got some really heavy blackout curtains, mm -hmm. you're going to get a blast of sunlight every 45 minutes. Yep, but. we actually do have um, – it, it is a window cover that we put inside the Dragon capsule for that exact reason so that you're not getting um, – <laughs> A fake sunrise every 45 minutes. Yeah, we have we have covers that we put on the windows in order to to prevent that sunlight intrusion. All right, and we're back with that video connection. This a view from Dragon looking up at the station right now. Dragon just about 450 meters away, uh, still starting to close in. We're continuing to fly up and around until we hit waypoint one. Expected to be there in about 23 minutes. Uh, if you look at that center screen, uh, you can see, again, just kind of relative to where the station we are. We're about halfway through this maneuver, um, so we're going to continue to swing up. Uh, and you can see the two different approach corridors now on that center screen. So um, center screen, the right side, uh, there's two triangular shapes, one shooting straight up, one shooting straight to the left. And those are that's what's called the approach corridor. That's just the space that we're looking for Dragon to stay inside during that final approach. And we're going to the zenith port, so the space-facing one. Um, so we're going to be flying through that one that was pointing straight up. And we'll be just in front of that in a little under 23 minutes from now. And then we should be moving past waypoint one and then right on to waypoint two.
All right, so we're just about 21 minutes away from our arrival at Waypoint One. So if you're just tuning in, we're already well into our kind of final rendezvous steps. Uh, we passed Waypoint Zero, which was just 400 meters below the station, and Dragon right now is executing a maneuver that's swinging it out in front and over top until we're directly in front of that docking port on the space-facing side of the Harmony module. So we've got about 20 minutes until we get there. Uh, the teams here in Hawthorne, monitoring the crew on board Dragon monitoring. We're looking over their shoulders right now. Uh, and the teams out in uh, Mission Control Houston also standing by as we're well into our integrated operations. Let's do a quick check-in with everybody over there. Uh, Shaniqua, give us an update. How's the team in H Mission Control Houston doing? How's the crew doing as we get through this final approach? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, so far uh, this afternoon, the crew on the station is doing good, and so is the flight directors and the flight controllers in Houston, uh, Mission Control Houston currently. Crew woke up on station around 3.30 p.m. Central Time after a nap period and began, pre began preparations for Crew 4's arrival. This included, as you discussed earlier, some casas or some temporary living quarters for the additional crew members and setting up that special software in the station's cupola to track Dragon's approach and docking. NASA astronaut and current station commander Tom Marshburn will be the prime, be prime for monitoring and making sure Dragon freedom stays in the expected zones. Once Dragon is docked, it will join five parked um, vehicles at the International Space Station, including SpaceX Dragon Endurance, which was which is what brought up Crew 3 astronauts back in November. The Northrop Grumman Cygnus space freighter, the Russia's and Russia's Soyuz MS-21 crew ship, and Progress 79 and 80 resupply ships. Again, after docked, Marshman will also be primed to start hatch opening operations. He'll start by op opening the large hatch on the node to Zenith port, giving him access to the pressurized mating adapter. The crew will then have to pressurize the vestibule, which is that small space between the hatches on the Dragon and the space station. This was previously exposed to vacuum prior to docking, so the crew will need to fill it with air and make sure its pressure is nearly equal to that of the atmospheric pressure on the Dragon and the station. Again, Dan mentioned 14.7 PSI. Marshburn will also allow, will have us release a small valve on the station's hatch to slowly introduce the air on the station's vestibule. And flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston will monitor and verify the pressure readings to make sure everything is leak free before we get ready to open up the hatches. Currently, NASA Flight Director Adi Bulos is leading the team here in Mission Control Houston for Dragon's approach and docking. Right next to him is the Capcom. Alex Kanalinkos, who will be communicating with the crew aboard the station. Right now, there are currently seven astronauts and cosmonauts living and working on the International Space Station, including NASA's Kayla Barron, Raja Chari, Tom Marshburn, European Space Agency astronaut Matthias Maurer, and Roscosmos cosmonauts Sergei Korsakov, Oleg Artemyev, and Denise Matveyev. Crew 4 joining will bring the crew complement to 11. Again, we're very excited to get the crew aboard. And that's it, Dan. We're looking good over here in Mission Control Houston. Back over to you guys in Hawthorne. All right, thanks so much, Shaniqua. And for everybody just now tuning in across NASA social media accounts, welcome. We got this view just for you. This is a look at the International Space Station from the Dragon spacecraft Freedom as it's in the final stages of its approach. We've essentially moved out directly in front of the space station right now. So we're looking uh, right at a docking port on the No2 forward where another Dragon is currently docked. We're gonna continue up about 90 degrees until Dragon's directly over top of the station, just 220 meters away from its docking port. And at that point we'll be at what's known as Waypoint One. Um, pretty soon the teams are going to do uh, just a final go, no go to proceed past waypoint one and on to waypoint two, at which point we'll stop just 20 meters away from the space station's docking port, do a final check on Dragon, Dragon Systems. SpaceX on Dragon to ground. No status update to report, just checking in. Vehicle continues to look healthy as we swing around to waypoint one.
We're getting a look at the, the core Jake Vendel, who's uh, just over our shoulder here in MCCX. And right on cue, here comes the sun. We're now entering into that orbital daytime. If you uh, look closely there, you can see the various Draco thrusters uh, firing. There's a total of 16 of them on board Dragon. Uh, 12 of them are located around uh, the body or the base of Dragon. Uh, and then there are four located around the forward hatch. Those are the forward Draco uh, thrusters. Since Dragon is approaching the space station, uh, whenever you see those uh, those forward thrusters uh, fire, it's basically you know course correcting, almost like slowing Dragon down. Um, but it looks like we're primarily utilizing the bulkhead thrusters. I mean, not the bulkheads, the bulkhead, the um, the side thrusters. Yeah, we'll be using those service sections for. Because we're, we're doing what's essentially a translational maneuver. So in, in your orbital mechanics, that's moving side to side, up, down. Um, and then we'll use the, we've used those forward bulkheads for all of our kind of pushing thrusts as we, as we were chasing down the space station. So as we're in this sunrise, lighting conditions are perfect to see some of those thruster firings. You're seeing it as Dragon just autonomously fine tunes its path. Uh, right up until we hit waypoint one in a little under 14 minutes from now. The propellants that we use on Dragon um, are actually loaded onto Dragon several days, uh, a couple weeks actually prior to launch itself. We do all of that uh, prop loading over at a place called Area uh, 59 or, or Dragonland, um, which is um, at, at, at Kennedy and uh, those propellants are, uh, are monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide, and they combust instantaneously when they meet each other. So there's basically, you know, two different types of holding tanks for that those propellants, um, and then whenever Dragon quickly flows those propellants into the combustion chamber of the Draco engines, uh, because of their properties, they boom, fire as soon as they touch. Um, this is different than how we uh, make fire on Falcon 9, for example. Um, in that case, with the uh, liquid oxygen and the rocket-grade kerosene, the RP-1, um, those two propellants do not ignite when they touch. Um, you actually need an ignition source. So for that, we use TTEB. Um, but in space, we don't want to you know, use an ignition source. Um, this version where we use what are called hypergolic fuels, or excuse me, hypergolic propellants, um, is safer for space and uh, they, and they, it's much faster of a, of, a, uh, of a reaction. And as you can see with these tiny bursts uh, from various directions, we need Dragon to be, to be quick. We need those thrusters to, um, you know, they're really more like impulses uh, more so than you know, just flat out burns. Yeah, those those hypergols come with the additional benefit of not require not requiring what's called cryogenic storage. So, uh, as you see, Falcon Nine fueled, we're, we're using that ultra densified LOX, and to keep fuels super cold takes a lot of energy, a lot Absolutely. of power. Um, and you can do that when you have an entire ground support system maintaining a cryogenic fuel inside a small space like a spacecraft, not really feasible, um, which is why you'll, it's extremely common to see these hypergolic fuels uh, used for onboard thrusters. We use the exact same mix uh, in the European service module for the Orion spacecraft. And in fact, almost the opposite of the Falcon 9 fuels, we actually have heaters <laughs> that we have on the tanks. Um, for, for those hypergolic fuels, just to, as you can store them much closer to almost a room temperature, uh, which is one of their real, real draws um, for use. In addition to the simplicity that Kate talked about, where you don't need that extra ignition source. Let's 
So we're still swinging around. We're just about 10 and a half minutes away from our, uh, our waypoint number one, which will put Dragon just 220 meters above the space station. It'll still be outside of what's known as the keep out sphere. That's our second imaginary shape around the space station that just helps to govern uh, the really the rules for approaching spacecraft. Uh, before you're in the keep out sphere, uh, you have to be uh, on what's essentially a four orbit or about a six hour free safe trajectory where if we completely lost control of Dragon, it wouldn't move inside of that sphere, uh, which is about 200 meters in radius around the station. And so what you're looking at, this is the maneuver we're on right now. We're a little more than halfway up that uh, kind of half circle line that you see on the left as we've moved from waypoint zero and we're moving on up to waypoint one. So we've already moved out directly in front. We're now moving directly over the docking port on node two uh, where Dragon Freedom is headed today. So the, the joint, the integrated teams uh, here at MCCX and over in Houston uh, are doing joint polls. Um, it's one of Everybody's favorite things in spaceflight is go, no goes. Um, and so they do these joint polls and we're just constantly assessing, not only making sure Dragon's ready, uh, but all the systems on board station are ready. We do a couple of uh, configurations to the station to get ready for the docking. Uh, we do uh, what's called feathering, just a special orientation of the solar arrays to help give them additional protection from any uh, plumes or just those thruster firings, those can uh, leave a residue if you don't, and that's any spacecraft uh, that's flying, and so we always orient the solar arrays. Um, we also are gonna be changing up how we uh, do the attitude control on station during this final approach. Um, typically, we're using the large gyroscopes on the US section just for nominal attitude control. Uh, and then when we get into the actual final approach of docking, uh, we hand over that control to the thrusters on the Russian segment um, who can provide uh, a much more kind of fine-tuned propulsive attitude control for that final approach. Just checking in, we're about seven minutes, 40 seconds away from the arrival at waypoint one, Dragon at a range of about 320 meters. And at this point, Dragon using a couple of different uh, navigational tools to, to make its approach autonomously. seven minutes away from waypoint one. And again, as everything continues to look good on Dragon Freedom, uh, thrusters performing nominally, we've got all the navigational tools that we need for final approach. We'll be able to move in from waypoint one down to waypoint number two, just 20 meters away from station. And then we will stop at waypoint two and the teams will do just a final check-in, and they'll give the go for final approach. And then after final approach is complete, again, we'll be moving at a pretty slow pace. We'll get that initial contact, uh, Dragon using the soft capture system to interlock with the international docking adapter. And then that soft capture ring will start to retract, bring the spacecraft in, and then we get ready for uh, what's called the hard mate, uh, where we drive 12 hooks uh, that will securely hold Dragon to the docking port. Six of those hooks have actually already been used on this flight. They hold down the docking or the nose cone during the ascent portion, 
and then those are one of the first uh, real checkouts or one of the first real operations after Dragon separates from Falcon 9 uh, is to open those hooks and get the nose cone open, revealing all of our navigation tools uh, in those forward bulkhead thrusters. Now, as Dragon, uh, we just started to move out of view there. We got another view here. We can see that it is slowly but surely making its approach to the International Space Station. Once again, this is the Crew 4 crew, a long duration mission to the International Space Station. They launched earlier today. Uh, actually, just this morning, uh, we had liftoff at 12.52 a.m. Pacific time, um, and everything was super go for our conditions, you know, as we talked about before. Weather is always a determining factor in whether or not we get to go to space. Uh, and while weather at the Cape was a little challenging throughout the week, um, we were able to get the Crew 4 crew out with, uh, you know, really gorgeous conditions uh, for a nighttime launch. And uh, everything has been going really well, very smoothly. The crew had a sleep period. Uh, you know, just a scheduled period where they had to go to sleep uh, in preparation for docking activities, which we are, uh, you know, coming up to. <clears throat> um, they've had two meals at this point. Uh, and as of right now, they are buckled into their seats uh, with their spacesuits on. And uh, they are monitoring the approach of Dragon capsule to the International Space Station. Uh, Dragon is fully autonomous, so it is flying itself right now. Uh, the crew acts as a backup to um, the system, essentially. But uh, Dragon is doing all the calculations in real time, uh, taking all the data coming in from the station, from Mission Control Center here in Hawthorne, from Mission Control Center in Houston, um, all of these inputs, analyzing them in real time and making those course corrections, which we just saw there. Um, that's what happens whenever we, we see those Draco thrusters firing, and uh, that's essentially just Dragon steering itself uh, to the next location that it has to go to, which uh, in this case is Waypoint 1. And we should be just about three minutes away from there, so after that we'll just be about 220 meters. Right now we're 250 meters away, so even as it's making this kind of swing up and around, it's moved in a little bit closer from that 400 meter range and we are down at waypoint zero. And then things do pick up after we get to, to waypoint one. We, we move in about 200 more meters until we hit waypoint two, stopping just about 20 meters, 60 feet or so from the docking port and then we wait for that final go for approach and docking. And then after they get docked, there's a flurry of activity that happens both inside Dragon and on the station side. Uh, on board Dragon, they'll get the go to doff or get out of their suits and they set them up to dry, essentially uh, attaching them Dragon, to fans. Dragon, SpaceX on the big loop. Approach one and soft capture ring, ring extension will begin shortly. Dragon will continue approach to waypoint two. The core here in Hawthorne, Jake Vendel. Vendel giving the Crew Dragon Freedom astronauts a heads up that uh, we're going to just proceed right past waypoint one, which will hit in under a minute and a half from now, and move directly in towards waypoint two. And that soft capture ring is going to extend out from the docking mechanism on Dragon. That's what's going to make that initial contact. Uh, it's essentially three large metal pedal like structures uh, that are going to interlock with the international docking adapter. And after they make that initial contact, it'll retract, bring Dragon in close. Um, essentially uh, right up until forming a perfect seal. And then we can enable those hard capture rings, 12 in total, to securely attach Dragon to station. And 45 seconds until arrival at waypoint one.
and we'll get an updated time after we get through waypoint one, but we should be just about 20 minutes away from docking. You can see lots of Draco thruster firings there. And we're just about to waypoint one. And we got confirmation, so we're through waypoint one. And we're moving on now to waypoint two. Again, these are primarily the service section uh, Draco thrusters that are firing essentially meaning they are located on the sides of Dragon, as opposed to the forward Draco thrusters, which are uh, located at the top of Dragon, uh, under the nose cone and around the, around the hatch. Uh, now, um, you know, with Waypoint 1 complete, uh, initial contact... Dragon and Station SpaceX on the big loop. Expect reconfiguration of the C2V2 link shortly. All right, so that initial contact between Dragon and the International Space Station uh, is expected in about 30 minutes. Um, now, before uh, before reaching Waypoint One, mission op mission operators conducted a go no go pull. Houston station on the big loop. Station is ready for docking. All right, we just heard uh, Tom Marshburn on board the space station. They're ready. Houston copy. All right, good news there. Um, so conducted a poll to allow Dragon to begin that approach to Waypoint 2, uh, which is located inside that keep out sphere, which is about 20 meters away from the space station. So we keep talking about these invisible shapes. They're all intended uh, primarily for safety of the crew, both onboard Dragon and onboard station. Yeah, and we, we do this with every vehicle, crew and cargo. Um, where we just have these checkpoints built in. And you, you put it beautifully earlier, it's very similar to a countdown for launch where we have these times, we have these moments built in to make sure all the different teams are in sync because we're constantly not just making sure that everything's looking good on Dragon, but also that all the systems on board the space station are ready to go. That's why we're in what we call these integrated operations. Uh, and as I've said a couple of times, we're gonna be doing it slow and steady at this point, um, right now we're just about 170 meters away from the station. We're going to get to waypoint two and pause, and then we're going to wait for that final go, no go. Um, the latest docking time we're looking at right now is about 18 minutes from now. Um, so it should be coming at around um, 4.42 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. We'll get an exact docking time when it happens. Uh, but we are still moving ahead of schedule. Um, we're still about 40 minutes ahead of when we thought we were going to dock. And this was already one of the fastest, or if not the fastest docking we've done on a Crew Dragon so far. Um, we're just continuing to stay ahead of schedule. Yeah, for sure. Uh, now, at that 20 meter distance from the station's docking adapter, Dragon's ap approach will slow and it'll begin to align itself with the adapter to come in for the final approach. Yeah, and we heard the soft capture ring is being extended, so that's just moving out a little bit from that very top part of Dragon underneath uh, the nose cone, and it'll make that initial soft capture, uh, essentially using those metal pedals um, to interlock with the international docking adapter, and after that contact is made, the ring on Dragon will retract, bring Dragon in a little bit closer, and then we can start the hard capture sequence. Um, and so Dragon soft capture ring has a bunch of dampers in the rotary springs and that just lessens the force as it brings it in a little bit closer and we make that initial contact with the station and after that we can engage those hooks and have a hard mate uh, and then get ready to go yeah. through hatch ops i uh, whenever i'm um 
explaining the process to uh, to younger people, um, I often like to reference the movie Interstellar because there's a couple scenes in there where the spacecraft is docking to that space station and there's like this great visual of the hooks locking in. Uh, and while the design is certainly different for uh, this space station and for Dragon, that, that is what we're talking about when we, when we refer to as hooks really locking in uh, to the Dragon capsule for that, for that uh, heart capture. All right, so we're just about six and a half minutes away from our arrival at Waypoint 2. So at this point, Dragon's pointed straight at the docking port. Uh, right now, again, so that docking port is on the top part of the space station. Dragon's looking straight down at the space station. Uh, and when we, if we are lucky enough to get a couple more views from Dragon, uh, we'll be looking directly down at planet Earth uh, behind the station as well. Uh, and it's going to continue to move into Waypoint 2. We're going to pause just 20 minutes away. Uh, we expect that to happen in about a little under six minutes from now. And then we get that final go-no-go -no -go for today, that final go-no-go -no -go for docking, after which uh, the uh, team on the ground here in Hawthorne sends a command and Dragon begins its final approach. Yeah, and we should note that while the other pause points were able to be skipped essentially that is one that is not skipped because of that go no go uh that final go no go point um yeah so waypoint two is up next uh and again that puts dragon only 20 meters away from the space station uh, from there the spacecraft will focus on station houston on the big loop station crew dragon is transmitting docking camera video please confirm video and data updating in dragon docking monitor Basically just asking the crew, can you see the live camera, please? Station can confirm video and data in the Dragon Docking Monster. Houston copies. Awesome. So there's a shot there of Mission Control Center here at Hawthorne, California on the left-hand side. And then, of course, Mission Control Center at Johnson Space Center in Houston on the right-hand side. Dragon, SpaceX on the big loop. We see the onboard for our GPS. No immediate concerns. Dragon is navigating on Dragonite. You copy. And so that call up right there. So our GPS is the relative GPS system. Again, that's one of several navigational tools Dragon has. Uh, basically GPS sensors on Dragon, talking to those on station. That's used for a lot of the approach when we're still quite a ways out still. Uh, but as you just heard, the crew told Dragon Eyes are those primary tools that we're using Dragon, now. SpaceX on the big loop, C2V2 link reconfiguration and soft capture ring, ring extension complete. With the RGPS-1 failure, we are still go for docking. And so again, just that quick update to the crew. Still go for docking. We're using the Dragon Eye. Uh, there's two on board Dragon. We're using one. Uh, with another one for redundancy for that final approach. Dragon Eye using LIDAR, essentially bouncing lasers off of reflectors on the space station, also using a thermal imager uh, to get range, Dragon range SpaceX rate. On the big loop, ground teams have pulled go for approach two. Upon confirmation of crew readiness, we will enable the approach. There's a good call. So the teams down here on the ground have pulled. The Dragon's healthy and in a good config. Station's healthy and in a good config. And so we'll pause when we get to 20 meters. And then as soon as the crew on Dragon tells us that they're ready, the team here in Hawthorne will send the command and we'll be in with final approach. Yeah, so just a good example there of really, as you've mentioned before, these are integrated operations, right? It is mission control there that you see on there on your screen located here uh, just behind Dan and I uh, at SpaceX headquarters, that mission control center from Johnson Space Center um, and, you know, the crew on board station and the crew on board Dragon. And as you just said, you know, just checking in with the, the crew on Dragon, hey, you ready to, ready to do this um, and get the, the final go from them. We also heard the crew on station is getting video from Dragon, and they have a number of displays 
uh, that they're able to see that video with overlays, making sure again, they're inside the docking corridor and things like that. If you followed the AX1 docking that hung us up at Waypoint 2 for a little while, as we had an issue on station getting that video routed, not an issue at all today. Um, and with uh, these missions, um, with a NASA crew on board Dragon, they're actually prime in the kind of in the command tree uh, for that final approach monitoring on board. On the big Visors are down a lot. All right, so Commander Chell Lindgren just reporting the crews close their visors, they're locked in. We're just about a minute and a half away from arrival at Waypoint 2. Yeah, so essentially that means that Dragon SpaceX on the big loop, we copied your last visors down. We just enabled the approach. As a final reminder, once Dragon is inside the crew hands-off point, retreat and breakout are not permitted. Station Houston on the big loop. Dragon is continuing approach and is go for docking. Monitor for steps five and six in procedure 1.102, Dragon approach and retreat monitoring. Copies. We're monitoring in steps five and six at this time. All right, that crew hands off point that we heard mentioned essentially means that um, uh, Dragon is the one that has to initiate uh, that docking abort. The, the crew is uh, not the one to do that. Um, again, this is Dragon just driving itself autonomously. It's taking all the data coming in from Station, from Houston, uh, from Hawthorne, and making those precise calculations as well as utilizing those Dragon eyes that are on board, uh, that LIDAR, which is just using lasers and, uh, and the thermal imaging, really to, to make that final approach um, and that precise docking. Uh, there you can see a view of Mission Control Center here in Hawthorne. Uh, these, uh, you know, right behind Dan and I, um, the crew, we heard before, their visors are down, uh, meaning that their, their suits are now also um, uh, their primary breathing device. Uh, so the, the spacesuit acts as an extension of the capsule itself. Uh, the crews have their spacesuits on, their visors down and uh, in the locked position, but they are plugged in using an umbilical to their seat, which provides um, telemetry and communications and air. So right now we are uh, flowing nit nitrox, which is nitrogen oxygen mixture uh, through the suits. And not only does it allow them to breathe, but it also keeps them cool. Uh, so it's a cool nitrox mixture uh, and really ultimately just intended to keep them comfortable uh, and obviously safe. And so at this point we've moved past waypoint two and we heard a bunch of the comms up to that crew. Um, so we were given the final go for docking. And so right now we should just be about four minutes away or so. And we don't have video at the moment. Uh, we're, we're in kind of a, a period where we're waiting to reacquire contact with our TDRS, our tracking data and relay satellites to get that live video back. We should get it back within the next two minutes or so. So we should have those views of docking. Um, we promise we're not just showing you us because we want to. As soon as we get views of that dragon again for that final approach, we'll be bringing it to you. We should be just about three and a half minutes, a little bit more from docking. Um, as you heard, we're going to hear a call out for crew hands off point. They'll just call up CHOP. Uh, and that, as Kate said, that just telling the crew they are not to send any commands to abort. At that point, any abort commands will come automatically from Dragon's flight computer. Um, so we're in our final approach. We're just about 15 meters away from the space station. Should be docking in just about three minutes from now. So we've continued to get further and further ahead on our timeline. I think we were looking at about a 5.15 p.m. Pacific docking. Uh, now we're, we're looking to do that almost 45 minutes early. Yeah, which is great. Um, you know, the crew lifted off from Kennedy Space Center, uh, pad 39A at 12.52 a.m. this morning. Um, and so 
it's been a pretty busy day for them. Uh, as I've said before, they did go through a sleep phase, which um, you know was eight hours where they had the ability, or rather the, the time to sleep, whether or not they were able to get to sleep, I, I hope so. Um, but there's about an hour before that crew sleep period called pre-sleep, and then there's about an hour after the sleep period called post-sleep. Uh, and it's you know just an opportunity for them to wind down, but then also wind back up in preparation for uh, you know all the activities that we've had today and still have upcoming. Um, as Dan said, we're just a couple minutes early. It was 10 meters. SpaceX copies 10 meters. We are less than 10 meters away, so just about two minutes from docking, and so we'll might be right on the edge of getting that video signal back, but uh, the teams and we're still getting telemetry, so we'll be able to know when that docking has occurred, and hopefully we'll get our kind of our high data rate communication back soon and be able to bring that live video. But they're, they're closing in. We're just eight meters away now, uh, about a minute and a half from docking. We'll hear that call out for CHOP come about 20 to 30 seconds before that initial contact which again is that soft capture ring on Dragon's uh, docking mechanism interfacing with the international docking adapter on board the space station. We're driving in towards the Zenith uh, port, the space facing port on node two, and we've got just six meters to go. Again, Dragon is driving itself at this point in time. So hopefully when we get our views back, we'll be able five to meters. show you. And there we just heard the SpaceX call. SpaceX copies, five meters five meters away from that soft, uh, that initial contact point. And we're under a minute away from docking. All right. Coming up on three meters and closing. Two and a half meters away, docking in about 30 seconds. Copy, two meters. One meter. One meter in closing. Confirmation. Dragon SpaceX on the big loop contact and soft capture complete. Attenuation in progress. And confirmation soft capture and docking confirmed. That time 4:37 p.m. Pacific, 11:37 GMT, with the International Space Station flying 261 statute miles over the Central Pacific Ocean. And there we got it. That's a gorgeous view. Now, of course, there are still a few steps that we have to complete before Dragon is securely attached to station. Dragon SpaceX on the big loop, soft capture ring retraction is in progress. There's our first full view of Dragon. Dragon Freedom attached to the International Space Station. Up next, we are uh, going to begin the hard capture sequence. That's essentially when we are engaging the hooks uh, around the docking mechanism. Well, unfortunately, we did have that video cut out right at that moment of docking, but it's great to see it attached now. Again, that initial contact, that docking time, 4.37 p.m. Pacific, 11.37 GMT, with Dragon and Station flying 261 miles over the central part of the Pacific Ocean. And we heard the, the retraction of the docking ring is underway, so slowly see Dragon inch a little bit closer to the docking adapter, and then we can kick off uh, that hard capture sequence. All told, it'll take about 10 minutes um, for everything to finish after we've, excuse me, completed that, uh, that initial soft capture. Uh, we'll get those 12 uh, 
docking hooks engaged, uh, basically doing them two, at, two sets, uh, one set of six at a time, uh, after which we'll have a uh, hard mate. And then all of the post-docking configs can get put into work, including umbilicals, uh, and then the crew's starting to step through uh, all of their post-docking, crew on board Dragon getting out of their suits, uh, and the crew on board station getting ready to go through the hatch operations. So with this view here, we are able to see uh, those Draco thrusters that we saw in action quite a bit uh, throughout the approach maneuvers. Uh, those, uh, well, the Dragon capsule to me is upside down, <laughs> but uh, for the orientation that it's in right there, kind of in the center uh, of the pressurized section, that, that shiny uh, bright white area, we see three ports that are kind of like ovals um, there are four clusters with three ports all around the, the base or the service structure of Dragon, and those are those service structure Draco thrusters that we utilize uh, for that precise maneuvering uh, as the Dragon approaches the International Space Station. I believe you can also identify uh, that green light that we were talking about. So there's a green one and a red one indicating what side is port, which side is starboard, starboard, star, starboard. Don't ask me which one is which. I don't like deep water, so I'm never, not really ever to, to be on a boat. But um, yeah, the, the green light there you can see uh, on the left-hand side of Dragon. Thanks to a quick refresher, port's the left side, starboard's the right side. <laughs> Dragon, SpaceX on the big loop, ring retraction complete, docking sequence is holding for MCS reconfiguration. Okay, so the soft capture ring has drawn in. Now before we start uh, to engage those hooks, we're going to do another reconfig of the MCS. That's the motion control system on board station. Um, during the approach and initial contact, we're under uh, all of our attitude controls being done by thrusters on the Russian segment. We do that with any approaching visiting vehicle. Um, now the docking has occurred. We're going to hand over control back to the U.S. gyroscopes, uh, which do our nominal or just our normal day-to-day -day attitude control. And so that puts station in a much more kind of quiescent. Uh, it won't be able to make any rapid adjustments, um, which could interfere uh, with the driving of those hooks. So as soon as the station teams have confirmed that we've handed over attitude control uh, over to the uh, U.S. system, uh, they'll be able to start driving in those 12 hooks to secure Dragon in place. Fun little fact. Station Houston on the big loop, MCS configured, proceeding with hook driving. Station copies. We were talking about uh, the red light and the green light. Uh, John Innsbrucker just sent me an IM, and the you know he's a very wisdom-filled person. Uh, he says port has four letters, as does left, and I will never forget which side is port now. So thanks, John I. <laughs> Once again, we can see that Dragon Freedom has made initial contact there with the International Space Station. Just a gorgeous view there. And again, we've, we've had confirmation that soft capture ring was retracted. Again, just standing by, uh, we heard uh, that uh, the MCS handover, the motion control system on stations occurred, and now it's going to be uh, time for the uh, those hard capture rings to start engaging. Again, there's 12 of them total. Uh, the first six have started to drive. Uh, they're, they're done in two gangs of six each. Um, these are 
this is the second time in this Dragon flight that we've done something with these hooks. Uh, they, six of these are engaged uh, during the ascent, the launch and ascent portion, holding the nose cone in place, uh, which you can see is open and swung out to the right there of the, uh, the international docking adapter. Um, those uh, drive open and release the nose cone shortly after Dragon gets on orbit. Uh, and now six of those driving uh, to do our initial uh, gang of hooks to start that hard mate process. And then once they're in place, uh, the second six will drive and we'll have a hard mate, um, hard mate of Dragon to the space station. Well, for those of you that might be wondering, <clears throat> excuse me, um, what the half black and half white part uh, of Dragon is, that is the unpressurized section known as the trunk. Uh, the side that is black, that's actually covered in solar panels. Uh, so that is what uh, the Dragon capsule utilizes while on orbit and you know making its way to the space station, essentially to provide power, generate power. Um, so we only have them on one side of the trunk and the other side of the trunk uh, is just painted white. You can right. just, sorry, I was just going to say you can just barely make out the, the heat shield there um, at the bottom of the pressurized section, uh, just above the unpressurized section. So, yeah, and we just heard that the first set of six hooks have engaged. And so now the second are driving. Once again, this is the hard capture, which is basically the final capture of the Dragon spacecraft to the International Space Station. Yeah, so once that second set of hooks are driving, we'll get confirmation of a hard mate, and then uh, we, we jump right into the hatch operations, and the, the crew on board Dragon will get the go to get out of their seats, out of their suits, uh, and start getting, uh, be free to move about the cabin, essentially and start getting ready to, to open up the hatches. They'll uh, hook their suits up to fans to dry them out before they get stowed. Uh, and then they'll have a couple of different tasks to do uh, after we get the hatches open in Dragon to just get it ready for that docked operations. And a lot of it's focused on the atmospheric control on board Dragon. Um, they're gonna be removing what's called a LIO canister, a lithium hydroxide canister that um, is used to scrub CO2 from the Dragon cabin during free flight. They'll remove that and seal it as we're going to be essentially integrating Dragon's cabin with the rest of the space station. And so not only will Dragon be able to use station power, station data and communications, uh, but will flow uh, air from the station stack uh, into Dragon and integrate it with all of its life support systems, generating oxygen, scrubbing carbon dioxide while it's, while it's attached. And we are hearing that the second set of hooks are closed, and we'll stand by. Dragon, SpaceX on the big loop, 12 good hooks, hard capture complete. They're on your screen. <clears throat> there on your screen is uh, SpaceX core crew operations and res resources engineer, uh, Jake Vendel. The core acts as the primary communication point um, from the mission control center here in Hawthorne to the crew on board Dragon. All right, so now that Dragon has completed the docking sequence, uh, the spacecraft must undergo a handful of checks before we will be able to open the hatch. The crew on board Dragon will now get a chance to get out of their suits before moving into hatch operations. That's right, and things are gonna be picking up on station two. 
NASA, t NASA's Tom Marshburn is going to be the lead for all of the, the hatch operations on the station side. Uh, first, he's going to have to open up a hatch uh, to gain access to the, uh, the pressurized mating adapter and the docking adapter. Uh, and then he's going to start uh, pressurizing that vestibule, that small space uh, between the two. So we've got confirmation, hard captures complete, and now we're ready to get into those ha hatch operations. Uh, one more time, if you missed it, docking occurred at 4.37 and 49 seconds. Uh, Pacific time, that's 11.37 and 49 seconds GMT, while both vehicles were flying 261 statute miles over the Central Pacific. Now, with Dragon firmly attached, we're going to toss it over to the International Space Station Flight Control Room in Houston uh, for Shaniqua Vereen to take us through the next steps as we get ready to open up the hatches. Shaniqua. Thanks, Dan, and thanks, Hawthorne, for your help today. We had a very exciting moment here in Mission Control Houston as well, following Dra Dragon's docking at 6.37 p.m. Central Time while flying 261 statute miles over the central part of the Pacific Ocean. It's great to see Dragon docked. The energy in the room here is high. There was applause and smiles all around the room. Now that we're docked, like Dan mentioned, Tom Marshburn is securing some hardware and then moving right into hatch operations. First, we'll get the large hatch at node 2 zenith, giving them access inside the pressurized mating adapter. Then we'll have to pressurize the vestibule. And that was core Jake Vendel in MCCX, SpaceX Mission Control in Hawthorne, California, giving the crew good words inside Dragon Freedom. Again, now that they are docked, Tom Marshburn inside the station is securing some hardware and then moving right into hatch operations. First, Dragon, we'll open SpaceX the large on Dragon to ground, no response required, cameras are external. We're currently in between satellites, and you're now seeing a live view inside the International Space Station Flight Control Room. Once we have views Dragon, back. Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to ground. No response required for your awareness. We'll be clearing the RGPS-1 alert shortly. And freedom copy. Thank you. Freedom SpaceX on Dragon to Ground. I had you five by five on the cabin mic. Copy, thanks.
if you're just joining us, we're, we have live coverage as we just watched as Crew Dragon Freedom docked to the International Space Station at 6.37 p.m. Central Time while flying 261 statute miles over the central part of the Pacific Ocean. Now that Dragon is docked, Tom Marshburn, as well as the rest of his crew, is securing some hardware and then moving right into the hatch operations. First, he will open the large hatch at node 2 Zenith, giving them access inside the pressurized mating adapter. Then we'll have to pressurize the vestibule, which is that small space between the hatches on Dragon and the space station. This was previously exposed to vacuum prior to docking, and we will need to fill it with air and make sure its pressure is nearly equal with the atmospheric pressures on Dragon and the station. Marshburn will use a small valve on the station's hatch to slowly introduce air into the vestibule. Flight controllers here in Houston will monitor the pressure and the temperature readings inside and verify that everything is leak-free before we get ready to open up the hatches. We expect this to take about two hours to get everything pressurized and checked out before we open the hatches. With Dragon's hatch currently targeted to open a little round, a little bit after 8 p.m. Central Time. Following hatch open, the crew will configure Dragon for an on-orbit ops and get a safety briefing. A few hours after that, Russian cosmonauts will wake up to begin their day, which will include a spacewalk. They will also have welcoming remarks with the four crew for astronauts. Dragon SpaceX on Dragon to Ground. ISS crew, ISS crew has begun vestibule pressurization. Feel free to pressurization. Feel free to reference 4.400 section 4 for telemetry if you'd like. And Freedom copies that's in work.
You're currently seeing inside the International Space Station as Tom Marshburn and Caleb Barron are preparing the area for the crew to ingress the space station. They're currently removing baggage and stowage area out of the way so there's more room for the crew to float through. And clarification, that was Rasha Chari and Caleb Barron removing stowage to prepare for the crew to float through once the hatch is, the hatch is open. Now docked, Tom Marshburn, current station commander, is now securing some hardware and moving into the hatch operations. You saw other crew members just removing stowage from the area, preparing for it to give them access to inside the pressurized mating adapter. They'll then be able to pressurize the vestibule, that space between the hatches on Dragon and the space station. This was previously exposed to vacuum prior to docking. On the big loop, on the big ISS loop, power connection, ISS power established. connection established. Freedom copies. With the earlier docking time, we also expect the hatch to open just as early around the 8 p.m. time frame, central time. It takes about two hours to get everything pressurized and checked out before we open the hatches between Dragon and the station. Following hatch open, there typically would be a welcome ceremony. However, the crew will be awaiting the Russian cosmonauts to awake and have welcome remarks with the rest of the other four crew members. Crew four will join them and make a complement of 11 astronauts doing welcoming remarks. That'll happen around 1.40 a.m. Central Time. Currently on station is crew three astronauts. That's astronauts Kayla Barron, Rasha Chari, Tom Marshburn, ESA or European Space Agency astronaut Matthias Maurer. Also aboard is the space also aboard the space station is Russian cosmonaut Sergei Korsakov, Oleg Artemyev, and Denise Matveyev. Currently on your screen is NASA astronaut Kayla Baring going through a stowage bag.
Dragon is currently in repress, about five more minutes on the leak checks, and about 45 minutes after that, we are looking for the hatch to open right around that 8 p.m. Central Time frame. If you're just joining us, we have live mission coverage of NASA's SpaceX Crew-4 mission to the International Space Station, where they'll stay for a six-month rotational mission. Dragon has officially docked to the station around 6.37 p.m. Central Time, and we're now awaiting repress of 
repress and pressurization of the vestibule between the space station and the Dragon Freedom capsule. Flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston are monitoring the pressure and temperature readings inside and verifying that nothing's leaking before we ready we get ready to open up the hatches. We're expecting it to take another 45 minutes to get everything pressurized and checked out before we open the hatches up for Dragon and the station currently targeted to open up around 8 p.m. Central Time. Following hatch open, we'll see the Crew 4 crew along with the other seven astronauts on board the station eagerly awaiting to greet their new crewmates. Post hatch open that will end our coverage today, but we'll actually come back on air around 1.40 a.m. Central Time to see the crew welcome remarks where crew three astronauts, NASA astronauts Kayla Barron, Rasha Chari, Tom Marshburn, ESA astronaut Matthias Maurer, and Russian cosmonauts Sergei Korsakov, Oleg Artemyev, and Denise Matveyev all greet and welcome each other aboard.
You're currently seeing live views inside the International Space Station in the Harmony module where Kayla Barron in, in your bottom left-hand corner is beginning to do some preparations or continue, continuing preparations for the arrival for Crew 4. They docked at the International Space Station at 6.37 p.m. Central Time while flying 261 statute miles above the Central Pacific Ocean. We expect Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to ground for status. And SpaceX from Freedom, we've got uh, four of us out of the suits. Uh, we are continuing uh, through the uh, two procedures, 4.012 and 4.400. And uh, you are welcome to come back on board if you want. Okay, copy all, Farmer. Thanks for the update. Uh, a quick update for you. We're seeing indications of a good vestibule leak check. Stand by for more. And we'll bring the cameras back on board. Okay, copy that, and for your awareness, we're about uh, 12 minutes into the suit dry cycle. Copy, 12 minutes. You just heard calls from the core or the crew operations resource engineer at SpaceX into the Crew Dragon Freedom telling the crew about a good vegetable check and the crew reported back that they have doffed their own their suits or taken off their suits and they are preparing for hatch open as well running through some checks on their side before the hatches can be opened Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to Ground. Cameras are back on board. We see Jessica's glove. <laughs> Copy that. Uh, welcome back. You're back seeing live views inside Crew Dragon Freedom. You currently see a couple empty suits still in the chairs as the crew are continuing to do preparations to open the hatch and ingress the International Space Station. We're looking for that ingress to happen around 30 minutes from now.
Dragon and Dragon and Houston, Houston, Houston on Houston on the ground two on the big ground two on the big loop. Nations listening on the big loop. And, and Freedom's ready on the big loop. Houston is reconfiguring for hardline calm, calm, calm during this next minute. About five minutes, minutes you will be down, uh, you will vehicle, down to vehicle, vehicle to calm. vehicle to vehicle You'll still have drag in the ground, drag in the ground and, and face to ground. Station copies. Station copies. Freedom copies. Freedom copies. And that was Capcom Alex Canalinkos here in Mission Control Houston relaying to the Dragon crew aboard Freedom that their calm to calm for Station to Dragon will be down about five minutes, but they'd still have connection through Space to Ground and Dragon to Ground to Mission Control Houston. NASA astronaut Kayla Barron running through it, her procedures and checklists on her iPad collect Velcro to her leg as she's running through procedures to continue preparations for Crew 4's arrival and ingress out of the Dragon into the International Space Station. Station and Dragon, Houston, Station and on Dragon, the big loop. Houston, we are ready for we are ready for vehicle to vehicle voice checks on hardline. Uh, 
and station copies on too. Freedom, how do you hear? Okay, freedom the copies, and we're ready. To. And freedom on the big loop is ready for voice checks. And freedom's ready for voice checks on the big loop. And Houston, Freedom, we have you loud and clear on station. And Station Freedom has you loud and clear also. Houston copies. Good voice checks. SpaceX Freedom for inventory. Freedom SpaceX on Dragon and Ground, ready to copy. Okay, Jessica, to read back, two meals from 309, two meals from 301, five water bottles from 208, and the rest of the meals are per the packing plan. That's a good read back. Okay, copy all. Thanks for the report. I want to clarify, does that include the uh, morning meal inventory from a few hours ago? The meals in 309 and 301 were our breakfast this morning, and we haven't consumed any food since. Okay, copy all. Thanks for the clarification. Sounds good. We're currently in a brief handover between satellites. You currently see a live view inside the International Space Station Flight Control Room. But we'll get views of Dragon and inside the space station back to you shortly.
Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to Ground for 4.400. Okay, Freedom, uh, we expect that the ISS side is close to ready for hatch open. We're hoping you can step into Section 5 of 4.400 for the waste system flush, and we will stand by for a report on which water bottle you intend to use for that task. Copies the uh, status. Uh, we have uh, water bottles set aside from uh, bag 208 that are already accounted. They were uh, partially used before. We're going to use those uh, for the waste flush. Okay, copy all. Thanks for the clarification. Sounds good. For those of you just joining us, crew four NASA astronauts Chell Lindgren, Bob Hines, and Jessica Watkins, and European Space Agency astronaut Samantha Christopheretti had a successful launch this morning around 2.52 a.m. Central Time from Launch Complex 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We saw crew four on Dragon Freedom dock to the International Space Station at 6.37 p.m. Central Time. We're looking for them to open hatches to let the crew ingress in just about 18 minutes from now. That's 8 p.m. Central Time. We're looking for the crew to be able to ingress, to open hatches and ingress into the International Space Station. We're in a brief handover period currently between satellites, and we'll have views of Dragon and the International Space Station back shortly. You are currently seeing a live view of the International Space Station flight control room here in Houston, Texas, where flight controller, flight director, Adi Bulos, saw us through integrated operations as well as docking. To his right, you see Alex Kanalenkos, the CAPCOM or the capsule communicator, who you'll hear talking to the crew from the ground up to the station. Dragon Station, we are ready for hatch equalization. And uh, Dragon copies, we're ready. Station Houston on the big loop, we need about three to four minutes to finish equalization. And Tom, just clarification on that, you go to equalize, it will take three to four minutes.
Copy, go to equalize and it'll take three to four minutes. And you're getting live views of Mission Control Houston, where flight controllers here are looking after the International Space Station, which Freedom Dragon just docked to around 6.37 6.37 p.m. Central Time. You just heard Capcom here in Mission Control Houston confirm with the crew that equalization is ready to start between ISS and Freedom. He also let the crew know that it would take about three to four minutes for that to continue and verify that the hatch is good to be open between the station and Freedom. Earlier we did hear a call to the crew saying that the ISS side is close to ready for hatch to open and that the system flush was needed on the SpaceX Dragon side. Again, the clock has started from Freedom to the International Space Station for equalization. It's in progress and we're looking for three or four minutes before that is complete. Again, we are between satellites and currently in a loss of signal, which is expected at this time. And so we're waiting on views to come return from Dragon and the International Space Station. As we wait, we are in the middle of a timer as equalization is underway. And that's waiting on pressurization to equalize between Freedom and the space station before the hatch can be opened. Again, we're in the middle of pressurization to equalize pressure between freedom and the space station. SpaceX, ready to copy on Dragon to Ground. Hey, 
um, could you please take the cameras external? We're going to be changing into our uh, suits. Okay, copy, I'll chill. We'll take the cameras external and get right back to you. Freedom SpaceX, cameras are external. Station Houston on Space to Ground 3, no response required. We see in the video, um, just letting you know that we're re reconfiguring the potable water source, so you may hear some valve movement. movement. Copy, thumbs up. And that was thumbs up from the crew, as they heard from Capcom. And we have good equalization on the ISS and between Dragon and the ISS. As soon as the space uh, craft crew for Dragon Freedom is ready, um, I'm told that we are ready to have hatch open just here shortly. Again, we're looking for that to happen around 8 p.m. Central Time. Dragon SpaceX on Dragon to Ground for next steps. Freedom, ready, copy. All right, Freedom, the ISS is ready. Ground teams are also ready for Dragon Hatch opening on your, uh, on your go. Um, sorry, you have a go to open the forward hatch. Um, and then contact us per step 6.6 .6 of 4.400. Okay, copy. Um, it's going to take us about uh, 5 to 10 more minutes. Okay, copy all. And you just heard from the crew operations resource engineer, or core at SpaceX, telling Crew Dragon, the crew aboard Dragon, that they are ready to open the hatch as soon as they are ready. The crew did report they need about five to ten more minutes before they're ready to open. But that's great news to hear that we are ready here shortly, around 8 p.m. Central Time, to open the hatch.
Again, preparations continuing on both sides. Station Houston on Space to Ground 3 for Kayla. Notice in your, uh, just above and to your right, there's a DPA cable sticking out. If you can tuck that back in just so, yes, that right there, so it doesn't get snagged. Thank you so much. And you just heard Capcom Alex Kanalenkos giving a few uh, checks left to the crew inside the International Space Station to prepare for the ingress of Crew 4. As you can see, preparations are still continuing between the ISS and on Crew Dragon Freedom. The Crew 4 astronauts are getting things configured and will join the seven-person crew on station, bringing the total crew members on station to 11. You currently see a view of all, th all four Crew 3 members, while the three Russian cosmonauts sleep. We will be back on air after hatch opening around 1.40 a.m. And all seven, excuse me, all 11 crew members will be awake for, a welcome, for welcoming remarks.
If you're just joining us, you're looking live inside the International Space Station as the crew aboard prepare for the ingress of Crew 4, which docked to the International Space Station Zenith port on the Harmony module at 6.37 p.m. Central Time. Pressurization and equalization has happened, and we are waiting for the SpaceX Crew, Dra Crew Dragon Freedom uh, crew members to uh, open their hatch and ingress the International Space Station. with about a 15 or 16 hour rendezvous to docking. This was one of the fastest, if not the fastest commercial crew um, flights to the International Space Station.
If you're just joining us, you're watching a live broadcast for the Crew 4 mission, which had a successful launch at 2.52 a.m. Central Time and docked to the space station at 6.37 p.m. Central today. Now we're just waiting for the crew to open the hatch and ingress or come aboard the space station, which will happen shortly. The crew on board station you see on the screen is NASA astronaut Kayla Barron and Rasha Chari. They're eagerly awaiting the crew for astronauts to come aboard. Station. This is uh, Freedom on uh, Big Loop. We are ready for hatch opening. Freedom SpaceX on the Big Loop. Go for hatch opening. Station copies. Dragon SpaceX on the big loop, hoping to bring cameras on board. Uh, please come on board. And you just heard a few checks from the Crew Operations Resource Engineer, or the core at SpaceX. Great news with that. Go for hatch opening.
and we do have a go for hatch open but we are waiting on the crew inside dragon to finish some preparations and open the hatch after the hatch is open it probably will take another few minutes for the crew to ingress the space station and be welcomed to their new home for the next six months as a part of the expedition 67 crew They will continue to walk through some procedures as they ingress, before ingressing the International Space Station. They are looking to install IMV ducting, mixing the air of the space station environment with the air inside the Crew Dragon Freedom. They'll seal some of the IO or lithium hydroxide cartridges that scrubbed carbon dioxide inside the Dragon capsule on the ride to the International Space Station. They'll check some vent valves as well as some vent wells as well, so they may be just a little bit more time until we welcome them aboard. And Dragon Hatch is open, and they are welcoming the Crew 4 astronauts on board. You see all smiles around as Jessica Watkins, Bob Hines, Samantha Christopher Reddy have ingressed and are hugging all their current Crew 3 crew members. And last one in, we see Commander of Dragon, Chell Lindgren, now entering into the International Space Station. You're currently looking at all eight crew members of crew three and four together inside the Harmony module, welcoming the new crew aboard. Crew three and crew four will do what's called a direct handover. For the next five days, there'll be two Dragons docked to the International Space Station. Crew three currently set to undock in just about five days from now. Station Houston on Space to Ground 3, no response required. Just letting you know, PWD is going to be down 10 to 15 minutes. Um, sorry for the timing, but... Uh, <laughs> And tell I'll owe you a beverage when you come back home. Houston Station IMV duct installation is complete. Go for IMV fan activation. Houston copies.
Wow, what an incredible morning. It is so great to see Crew 4 astronauts finally on board the International Space Station. After about a 15-hour flight, the crew is now aboard and ready to continue their six-month rotational mission aboard the International Space Station. They were welcomed by the current Space Station crew members of Crew 3. The full complement now up to 11 human beings as a part of the Expedition 67 crew. It's been an incredible 24 hours and with crew board, crew four now aboard the International Space Station. That's it for us in Houston. Welcome aboard crew four. Now let's turn it over to Hawthorne. Thanks, Shaniqua. Uh, so great to see Crew 4 on board. Uh, as she said, it's been quite a 24 hours. Uh, you know, we had everything kicked off really with suit up. Um, that was actually yesterday around 11.50 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and then later on, a couple hours later, we saw the crew ingress into Dragon Freedom. Uh, that was around 1.17 a.m. Eastern. And then of course we had an on-time liftoff from Kennedy Space Center pad 39A at 3.52 a.m. Eastern this morning. Uh, that was followed by a stage one landing on our drone ship, um, a successful dragon separation, as well as deployment of the nose cone, which we saw in action uh, on our webcasts. And then uh, if you join us earlier this afternoon, you saw the uh, five major burns that Dragon performed uh, as it approached the International Space Station. We were able to confirm docking at 7.37 p.m. Eastern, uh, and then we just saw ingress into station just a couple minutes ago. So super exciting. Uh, on behalf of SpaceX and NASA, I want to thank you for watching watching today's webcast and for your interest in this exciting fourth rotational mission. Yeah, and now that the crew is on board, they've got a couple of tasks to go through. Uh, Shanique was talking about they're going to be integrating Dragon's cabin with that on board the station, you know, on the ride uphill. Dragon has its own uh, ECLIS environmental control life support system regulating. Uh, temperature, humidity control, scrubbing CO2, uh, and that temperature, by the way, can be actively controlled by the astronauts on the displays or changed by the team here in Mission Control Hawthorne. And so they have to install that IMV ducting. We heard that done, the intermodular ventilation, integrate Dragon's cabin atmosphere with the rest of the station. Uh, they're also installing some seals around the hatchway around Dragon uh, and a hatch cover as well. And with them arrived, we're less than a week away now from the return of crew three. So pretty much everything we just saw, we're gonna see in reverse <laughs> yeah. as those four crew members get ready to come home and end their long duration stay on board the station. Uh, as you heard, right now we're targeting May 4th for that return. Everything is gonna depend on weather, so be sure to follow NASA and SpaceX as we're gonna be bringing you live coverage of their entire journey, but then follow us on social media for real-time updates as we continue counting down to the end of the crew three mission. So, Thank you again for watching. Go NASA, go SpaceX, go Crew 4, and pretty soon come home Crew 3. Uh, with that, we'll wrap it up, and we'll see you again real soon.